moment to connect uh, the PowerPoint, please. Defense will call Dr. Colin King to the stand. Doctor, you're going to approach the witness stand. You're going to stand in the witness box. Face my clerk to be sworn, please. Please raise your hand. Under penalty of perjury, do you swear or affirm the statement here about to make to this court will be the whole truth? I do. Thank you for that. Thank you. Good morning, sir. If you could please state your full name for the record and spare your last name. Sure. My name is Colin King. C is in Charlie. O L I N. Last name is King. K I N G. Thank you. Defense your witness. Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. King, I'll let you get situated. Let me know when you're ready. I am ready. Okay. Doctor, what is your highest qualification for education? I have a PhD in counseling psychology. And where did you obtain your degree? From Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. What licenses do you hold? I am a fully licensed uh, psychologist, and I'm also licensed as a professional counselor, so I'm duly licensed. What certifications do you have? So I'm certified as a, a board a forensic counselor, a board certified sentence mitigation specialist, a certified advanced addiction specialist. Have you ever had your license revoked or suspended? No, ma'am. Where did you do your internship? So I did my in internship in uh, Michigan City, Indiana, and that's at a, a, a psychiatric hospital mm -hmm. um, that uh, treat uh, children adolescent and uh, adults. And then I did a second internship at Southwest Detroit Community Mental Health, um, working with patients with chronic mental health issues and uh, poly substance abuse. Okay. Your Honor, just for the record, it appears that the witness is consulting some documents. Could we just identify what those are? Thank you, sir. What do you have that's currently with you on the witness stand? Sure, I submitted um, a copy of my, of my CV. Thank you. And is that what you're referring to? Yes, yes. Would you have a copy of the CV? 
Yes, Your Honor. He's, he's got a whole binder. I just want to make sure I understand what he's consulting. Yes, yeah, I can absolutely you. tell you what is in my uh, binder, sir. Sure, there's no need, sir. If you could please set the binder aside and let's okay. specifically ask to refer to it. Okay. Thank you. You may proceed. Absolutely. Your resume indicates that you also <laughs> lectured at a number of universities. Can you describe that? Yes, so I, as an adjunct professor, I lectured at Wayne State, um, Eastern Michigan University, Ashland <laughs> University, and uh, University of Detroit Mercy. And what courses did you teach there? I taught classes in uh, multicultural issues and uh, psychological testing. You also worked as a special education consultant, is that correct? That is correct. And what did you do there? I consulted uh, one of the charter schools in Michigan um, doing um, IEPs and um, psychological testing. You also have listed that you are a brain injury expert. Can you tell me about your experience treating brain injury and or mental illness? Absolutely. So I, I've worked with a large uh, Midwestern brain injury um, facility, actually one of the largest in uh, Michigan. And um, over the last maybe 23 years or so, um, I have treated various forms of brain injury, uh, mental illness, and patients with uh, poly substance abuse. Um, in fact, <clears throat> I was tasked as a part of my um, assignments, tasked with supervising teams of occupational therapists, um, physical therapists, nurses, and psychologists. I traveled to different and states um, and met with uh, neurologists um, and uh, assessed patients who were injured due to maybe auto accident or spinal cord injury or stroke. Um, had an opportunity to look at their uh, medical records and review their records with physicians and then returned back to Michigan and set up treatment programs for them. I also um, travel to Loma Linda University, which is one of the largest, um, which has one of the largest cadaver labs in the nation, mm -hmm. and had an opportunity to meet with a neuropathologist and got a chance to look, look at various models of the brain to handle the brain and to see how it works. Um, I've also uh, attended various lectures at the uh, Amen clinics and you may know he used the award win on change your brain, change your life. I actually had my own brain scanned. And so that gives me my experience in brain injury. Have you ever testified in any juvenile life cases before? I have. In what counties? Um, Wayne, Macomb, Genesee, and I think Jackson. In the last three years, approximately, how many, how many juvenile lifers, homicide, or competency cases have you testified in? Probably about 24, 25. Have you been previously qualified as an expert? Yes, ma'am. Your Honor, at this time, I move to have Dr. Colin King um, as an expert in mental health, forensic psychology, and brain injury. Um, Judge, I understand he's interviewed. No, I'm sorry, may I, Judge? Yes. Uh, I understand that he's interviewed the defendant and he's here as a mitigation specialist. And I don't have any I issue with that. Um, there's nothing in his report or in the record to indicate that this defendant has any kind of brain injury. Um, so I would object to his qualification on that simply because it's not relevant to the proceeding. Thank you. As it relates to any brain injury, unless there can be foundation laid that this defendant has brain injury, then that's not appropriate. However, I will qualify this witness as an expert in mental health and forensic psychology, is that correct? That is correct. He is so qualified. Thank you. Thank you. And Your Honor, we do have a demonstrative PowerPoint uh, to explain his report. <laughs> All right, so I want to go over uh, the process that was taken. Is it right here? Yeah, just take this next one. So let's start with the process. Um, it is my understanding that you became involved in this case in December of 2022, is that correct? Yes, ma'am, that is correct. All right, um, and 
Can you tell me what you did first? So I, um, I spent approximately uh, 23 to 24 hours um, testing Ethan Crumley over about six sessions. And I used um, um, about 15 different assessments and I turned in my uh, report, which is about a six to nine to seven to page report. Okay. Some of the testing, was it done in person? Yes, yes ma'am. And then some of the testing, was it done on computer or by Zoom? It was done virtually, yes ma'am. So you interviewed him um, multiple times, approximately one year after the incident, a little bit longer than one year, is that correct? That is correct. Were you also given a litany of records, videos, text messages, um, and reports to review? Yes, ma'am. Did you then do research to gather data and establish the standards that are required? I did. Here we also have that you consulted with a Dr. Malcolm Court uh, that is a sociologist. Why is it important to peer review? Well, because I wanted uh, a different discipline to look at my work and to provide me feedback on my work. I wanted to make sure that it was not just my personal opinion, but that my work was based on um, testing and solid scientific evidence. And you're going to draw your attention to um, Exhibit O, the CV of Dr. Malcolm Court in Exhibit P, the report of Dr. Malcolm Court, uh, which reviews Dr. King's findings. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You want to move to the next slide? Judge, if I may, I, I believe we stipulated the admission of exhibits with the understanding Dr. Court was a witness. And so I had some questions for Dr. Court, and now it's, what it sounds like is he's not going to testify. So I have an issue with the court using his report as a basis, as evidence in this case, um, without the chance to cross examine. So Dr. Court was not listed on my witness list? Um, I did have conversations with Mr. Keese, the fact that Mr. Court would not be called. This should not be a surprise at all. And they did not object to my exhibits. Okay. Judge, I'll do with this to wait the, the evidence for the court to consider. Thank you. Thank you. The court will apply the appropriate weight, noting that the doctor will not be testified. Thank seat. you. So as a brief overview, um, <clears throat> what is it that you looked at in regards to this case um, to form an opinion? Sure, so I looked at uh, Ethan's uh, early life. I looked at, at the uh, parental influences and activities. I looked at the Oxford school system, um, testing results, um, events leading up to the shooting, the day of shooting, and a review of uh, mental illness. Okay. 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 All right, so let's talk about uh, early childhood experiences. Um, can you discuss that? Absolutely. Again, Bernie, he's consulting uh, he something. He has the PowerPoint. Okay, it's, it's simply the PowerPoint? Yeah, this is a, sir, this is an exact copy oh. that you step in. And anytime you're referring to something on the witness stand, the parties need to be aware of what you're looking at. And so you just can't just pick something up and start reviewing it. First, the defense attorney or the prosecutor has to prompt you to look at something. So what are you currently looking at, sir? Um, I have an exact copy of the PowerPoint that is on the screen, sir. Thank you. And that's the only thing that you're looking at right now? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You may continue. Thank you. All right. So let's start again. Um, early childhood experiences. What did you come across when examining all of the evidence and discussing the matter with Mr. Crumbly? Certainly, I, in my review of the records, um, I saw that as, as early as age 10, um, matter of fact, even going back to age six, there were some issues. Um, I interviewed a neighbor and looking at the records, which were corroborated is that he was left unattended as early as age six to go crawl to the neighbor's house, especially when there was like a thunder shower. And he reported that he was afraid and would ask for help. And they would ask him where were his parents. And his response was, I don't know. 
uh, in the records uh, at age 10, um, there's text messages between Ethan and his mom saying to her, when are you going to come home? And there were no responses. Um, in my interview with Ethan, he explained that he spent countless hours watching um, various uh, adult um, uh, games. Um, some of them are in my uh, report and uh, Assassin's Creed, um, Grand Theft Auto. And he also spent an inordinate amount of time going to different websites mm -hmm. and indulging in various uh, graphic, graphic scenes and indicated after a while, he began to fantasize about being part of those scenes. Mm -hmm. So he sort of lost track of reality. You also have listed trauma. What is trauma? Trauma is sort of an insult to the person, an insult to the brain. So it could be as a result of parental discord. Um, it could be as a result of high levels of anxiety or high levels of depression. Um, anything that insults the person's brain can be classified as trauma. What about constant stress from parents fighting? Yes, uh, uh, um, parental dysfunction, constant and intense dysfunction can induce trauma. In my interview with Ethan and in a review of the records also, there's frequent references to either parent threatening to commit suicide. And on some occasions, Ethan has had to be the one intervening at such a young age. What about um, the loss of a grandparent or the loss of an animal, especially in a violent death? Um, absolutely. Uh, Ethan disclosed that one of his sort of soulmate was um, a large dog that, that um, he, uh, he had cherished and um, it died at home and he was the one tasked with having to remove it and take it back to the shed and figure out how to dis, uh, dispose of it. And you saw the Google searches where he actually is looking how to dispose of a dog that has passed away. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am, that is correct. What about the loss of a best friend? Um, the loss of a best friend and perhaps your only friend uh, is, uh, could be a pretty traumatic experience. As in the case of Ethan, and as seen in the record, he spent hours and hours communicating with his best friend and mm -hmm. pouring out his heart and disclosing what was happening to him. Um, were you also told what his mother told him when that friend went away to a rehab? Yes, ma'am. And what was that? Um, she told him that he would probably never see his friend again. Let's move on. Dr. Keating, um, when he testified last week, touched on ACEs. Um, can you explain what that is to the court? Yes, yeah, so I think in 19, uh, 1995 and 97, my, my year could be off, the CDC and Kaiser commissioned a study where they looked at 17,000 people. Um, and they, they have established what is called ACEs or adverse childhood experiences. And what the research researchers saw was that between the ages of zero to 18, children exposed to abuse, physical or emotional, uh, mental, um, parental dysfunction, or incarceration, the more ACEs someone has, the more likely they are to have mental health issues. In fact, what the research has discovered is that with six or more ACEs, the probability of that person dying 20 years earlier than their peer is greatly improved. Okay. And were you able to find a number of these factors when you interviewed um, Ethan as well as reviewed the records? Yes, ma'am. 
In a number of, of our conversations, um, you had discussed fer feral child. What is a feral child? So a feral child, and I would love to read the definition if I can. If you can give us the definition, that would be fine. Certainly. It's essentially a child who has been abandoned. Um, initially, this phenomenon was known um, as someone who is abandoned physically. But then there is an emotional and a psychological um, construct to it. So what the researchers saw is that someone who is abandoned has what is called arrested development. Hence, they lack social skills. They lack social awareness, they lack social cues, and essentially become misfits in society. And why do you feel that this is relevant in your review of this case? So when I interviewed Ethan and just looked at his, at his profile, um, at his high level of isolation, um, lack of parental support, lack of guidance, lack of resources. So psychologically and socially, he can be considered a feral child. You also had the opportunity to review some text messages between Ethan's parents, correct? Yes, ma'am. And Your Honor, just for your notes, it is Exhibit F. Thank you. I apologize, Exhibit G. <laughs> and in those text messages, were you able to see where they were discussing situations that Ethan was going through as early as March um, or even October of 2020? Yes. And what did those text messages show you? So um, very clear indication um, that his parents were not in tune to what was going on with him um, in this string of text messages, he actually woke up in their room one day and the mom and dad was, uh, they were exchanging text messages and, and they were sort of joking that Ethan was asking, what am I doing in your guys' room? And one of the text messages stated that he seemed to be under the influence of substances and one parent asked the other, did you give him one of your Xanax? And she said, no, melatonin. Okay. So do those text messages show that Ethan was experiencing things that his parents at least were observing at this point? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right, let's move to part two, which is the parental influences and activities. Um, I know that we touched on things that Ethan reported, the threats of suicide made in front of Ethan. Um, what else did you find that was interesting under this section? So under this section, um, Ethan witnessed um, just a litany of uh, verbal abuse, frequent taunts. And I guess the part that sort of stood out for me was when he told his, his parents that he was hearing voices and he needed to see a therapist. I don't know what 15-year-old raises his hand and says, my brain hurts, I need to see a therapist. And it never happened. What did you find out about the purchase of the gun and then going to the shooting range? So there seemed to have been discord between his parents. Um, I think his dad bought the gun out of spite. And then his mom took him, took him to the shooting range out of spite because they were, they were arguing. So there was constant just discord and family dysfunction. And in your interview with Ethan, um, did he report that he was ever taken to any sort of doctor to deal with this? In my review of the record, there was no indication that he was ever taken to a doctor. In 
your interviews and your discussion with him about the constant situations that were going on, was there constant arguments about divorce um, and which parent that Ethan would choose? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Can you explain that a little bit? So, yes, there was frequent uh, uh, just uh, harsh discussions about infidelity, um, suicide, uh, and which parent Ethan needed to choose to live with when they separate or the event that they separate. Okay. Were you able to look at the text messages between Ethan and his friend um, over the months leading up to um, November? I did. All right. And what's the significance that you found with those text messages? So in reviewing those text messages, Let me just say, Ethan had no idea that these text messages were going to be made public. And so he was having private conversations with his, with his friend. And in one of his text messages, which is on, on the uh, screen, he says that my mom thinks I'm taking drugs, but she doesn't worry about my mental health. In another of the text messages on the screen, he said, I have an effing breakdown in the shower. And in the text messages also, he said, from what my mom said last night, I went outside in my shorts and I have no recollection of that event. And in another text message on your screen, he said to his friend, I am hallucinating. And he said, I hear like people talking to me. These were actual text messages back and forth between himself and his friend. I want to move next to part three, uh, which is the Oxford school system. Were you able to take a look at the counseling that was available to Ethan at the school, as well as the reports surrounding the school's interaction with Ethan the day prior and the day of the incident? Can you repeat that question? Sure. Um, were you able to look at Oxford School System and their counseling program, as well as the interaction that the school system had with him the day before, as well as the day of the incident? Yes, I did. Okay. And can you explain what you found? So what I, what I found was that in terms of the, of the uh, available resources for intervention, it does not, it did not appear to me from my, from my review of the information that, that, that he was afforded any type of mental health uh, assistance. Okay. Right. You also mentioned in your report implicit bias. What is that? Um, so implicit bias um, is, it's, sort of like the unconscious forces. You know, I can use an, an analogy of a peanut butter jar, which is actually on one of their slides. Mm -hmm. And so a child learns how to use peanut from a peanut butter from a jar mm -hmm. because the child is taught by the parent how to do that. They learn how to um, un unscrew and cork and unscrew the peanut butter jar to get peanut from their peanut butter. Mm -hmm. So after a while, they learn it so well that they're able to do it unconsciously. The grooves on that bottle represent the groove that society grooves us with so that we have certain perception of things and people. Well, that's how implicit bias works. Let me give you another quick example. I was in court in uh, Detroit and about to step into the elevator and there was an attorney and um, other people. I was dressed in suit and tie, and the attorney turned to me and said, counsel, come on in. I'm not an attorney. But he made the assumption, based on how I was dressed and how I comported myself, that I was an attorney. Well, that's how implicit bias works. So it's not necessarily a bad thing, nor a good thing. It's a thing, but it can have deadly consequences 
if it's not used appropriately. Okay. Now, um, you also stated that you had a chance to look at the resources that were available to any high school student at Oxford High School. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And um, is there a rubric or is there a standard that is required for a school um, to have counselors, to have support staff, or to be able to help the students when they have issues? Certainly. So the, the American School Counseling Association, known as ASCA, this is sort of like the, the monitoring body that makes recommendation in terms of social worker to student ratio. So the recomm recommendation is that there be minimum one social worker to about 250 students. And what that body says is that if you have a ratio of one social worker to a thousand students, you are not even getting into the classroom. Were you able to find the data, um, and I know that it's contained in your report, regarding Oxford in the year prior and the year of the incident? Certainly. Okay. Um, and Your Honor, just because they're numbers, I ask if it's okay that he refer to his notes uh, just to get the numbers correct? Do you need Richie? No, Your Honor. Thank you. You may search. So in the 2019-2020 uh, school year, what was the social worker to student ratio in Oxford? So it was um, approximately one social worker to about a thousand students. What about 2020 to 2021? Um, it was one to one social worker to about 900 students. <clears throat> and then what about 2021 to 2022? It was about one to about 900 students. So you went even a step further um, to look at suspensions and expulsions. Is that correct? Yes, I did. And what were your findings? So in my research in the Oxford school system, um, just in terms of, of raw data, I saw that um, whites comprised about 80% of the uh, school districts um, enrollment um, and uh, blacks comprise I think about just under five percent and uh, Hispanics about 12 percent which is reflective I believe of the society so there was nothing um, revealing about that however when you begin now to disaggregate the data because data tells you something so that when you begin to disaggregate it, you see a pattern, which is visible on your screen. So whites, 80% enrollment, and in terms of suspensions, 68% of the students suspended were whites. Blacks, enrollment, 5%. Suspension, 12%. Let's look at expulsions. Mm -hmm. Again, whites, 80% of the population. Expulsions, 44%, so about half. Blacks, 5% of the population. Expulsions, 22%. Hispanics. I think about 12% of the uh, population, expulsions, 22%. What this data is telling you is very significant, is that all the students are suspended or expelled at a disproportionate rate when considered to the majority population. And then when you dig a little deeper, you have to ask yourself, what are we missing? And as it pertains to Ethan, as you will see, is that the students are not subject to the same degree of rigor, which is why implicit bias is so important. 
Okay. And can you explain just so it's clear how implicit bias ties into these findings? Absolutely. Because if you believe that a student is not a problem, you are less likely to pay attention to that student. Even if, even if you are shown overwhelming evidence about problems, implicit bias says, you give this person a pass because that's how you've been groomed. You, you make certain assumptions. So you give certain people a pass based on your assumptions. However, if you give a person a pass who is a problem, it creates a bigger issue. Okay. So I wanna go into a little bit of what you call a pass. You were shown a number of assignments that were found in Ethan's backpack, correct? Yes, ma'am. And you would agree with me that, um, and your honor, were, these exhibits can be found in exhibit C. Thank you. There is a number of pieces of paper with guns, with bullets, and other alarming scenes drawn on them. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. I know the prosecutor made mention that we aren't 100% certain um, that these were seen by teachers, but they were in his backpack and our school assignments, correct? Yes, ma'am. Were you also able to look at emails between the teachers um, the day before this incident, as well as the day of the incident, discussing the uh, things that had come to light from the teachers trying to give warning to the people in the office. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And your honor, that's also found in exhibit C. Thank you. And what did those emails show to you or how do they tie into implicit bias? So just looking at the emails, I was, uh, just red flags went up. One teacher said, and it's on their, their screen of this exhibit. Um, and this is from Ms. Kropinski. She said, I know Jackie emailed you guys yesterday with some concern about Ethan Conley in our first hour class. Today, he's watching <coughs> videos on his phone and a guy gunning down people. It looks like it's a movie scene and not security footage a real event, but definitely still concerning when taking into account some of his behaviors. I continue, and this is from Ms. Dubini. I had a student doing first hour. Ethan Crumley, who was on his phone looking at different bullets at the end of first hour today. As I was walking around the room, passing out, their essays, I didn't get a chance to investigate it a bit further since it was at the end of the hour. Now that he's on my radar, I'm also noticing that some of his previous work that he completed from early in the year lean a bit toward the violent side. I can bring these down, these things later today during my fifth prep hour. And we can tell the time on that email is 9.33 a.m., correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. The assignment um, that Ms. Kubina is talking about, um, you had a chance to look at, and it's contained as well in my exhibit. It's a note card where a gun was erased, correct? That is correct. Okay. And the per there is also a drawing of a person with an arm outstretched with the gun, correct? That is correct. All right. So I want to get into the brain and mental illness. You can go to the next one. What is mental illness? So uh, it's a, a substantial disorder of thought or mood that significantly impairs um, judgment, behavior, 
and the capacity to recognize reality. Mental illness is actually a symptom of a deeper problem. So, for example, if someone has a chest pain, a chest pain is a symptom of a deeper problem. It could be a pulled muscle, or it could be because of a heart attack. So mental illness is a sign of brain disease. <clears throat> So there are multiple ways to study the brain, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Can you briefly discuss those different ways? Certainly. So one way is to look at the brain directly. So cardiologists look at the heart, dentists look at the teeth, and mental health people should look directly at the brain through various brain imaging techniques which are available. So that's one way. A second way is you want to test the brain directly through psychological instruments. Then a third way um, is what is utilized by psychiatrists and psychologists, and that is to use symptom clusters. So for example, if someone comes to me and they say, um, for the last month or so, I've not been sleeping well, I've not been eating well. Um, I've been skipping out on work. I've been crying. I've been sad and blue. Then I go to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the DSM, and I look at symptoms. And if the person has, for example, five of these eight symptoms, then I can diagnose that person like with major depressive disorder. So that's the third way of looking um, at the brain. And then the last one really is not appropriate, and that is that you guess. So what you do, you say, well, because I see you acting in this way, and because you can plan, and because you can execute, and because you can do these things, I know that you're not ill or don't have a brain dysfunction. That is guessing. So were you able to actually look at Ethan's brain directly through imaging? I was not able to. Okay. So did you then decide to test the brain using assessment tools and perform a number of testing? Yes, that is correct. Okay. Go to the next one. Can you explain, explain to us um, the brain and exactly how easy it is for the brain to be damaged in a variety of ways. Absolutely. So, Judge, I'd just like some, I'd like some foundation for this area. There's just no evidence in the record that this defendant suffered any brain damage. Absolutely. Were you able to view a video uh, taken at the 5-1 diner? Yes, I did. Okay. And in that video, Actually, we'll go ahead and play it now so since it's. So, what I would like to sure. emphasize, one second, she has to ask a question. I'm taking the way. Sure. Um, so, were you able to, in your discussions with Ethan and the evidence that you were presented, were you able to, um, or did you have some concern that an injury to the brain could have occurred based on what he reported as a child and what you saw in this video? Let's go ahead and play the video. This is my exhibit R. There is no sound in this video. So this is from 2020. What did you observe on this video? So I observed um, Ethan walking in the diner and for some inexplicable reason his head takes a direct hit to the to the floor and observed him trying to get up on his own volition mm -hmm. but he was not able to and as we know the brain is very soft it has the consistency of soft we call it a raw egg and it's housed in this very hard box called the skull that has very sharp ridges. 
the brain is very susceptible to injury, and I am love to do a demonstration with your permission. Sure, Your Honor, he has a demonstration uh, to show with an egg, as he described, how exactly, how, how soft the brain is and how little it takes to injure the brain. Would the court allow? Hold on. I'm sorry, someone's just approaching yes, without I asking permission. I'm sorry, what exactly are you trying to do? Yes, Your Honor, my, my witness would like to demonstrate to the court how easy it is, as he described, the brain is like a raw egg inside of the skull. He would like to demonstrate to the court how easy it is, even a fall like this, to damage the inside of the brain. Is there an objection? Judge, I guess I just wonder what the, what the basis of that testimony is. It, it sounds like it's just Dr. King telling us. Um, and the, the idea that it's the consistency of an egg, I see it in his report without citing anything. So like some foundation that this is not just Dr. King's theory. Thank you. Respectfully, your argument goes to the weight of this demonstrative evidence. I'm saying the court will apply the appropriate weight. You may invoke the witness. <clears throat> And can you demonstrate, uh, since obviously this is a video courtroom and we're recording, can you demonstrate uh, or discuss what you're going to demonstrate? Absolutely. So as I previously mentioned, based on- you can see because I can't see what you do. My apologies, Your Honor. Thank you. So as I mentioned, uh, 100 billion neurons and a trillion connections in the brain, and this is scientific evidence. This is not my opinion. This is how the human, the human brain is uh, engineer, and it has the consistency of soft butter or raw egg. I've had the opportunity to visit the lab in Loma Linda. I have handled the human brain, and I, I've seen how the human brain works and how it looks like. It has the consistency of an egg. Ethan is about six feet, two inches tall. Um, and this is not six feet, two inches. This probably is about, I don't know, so can you, before you move on, sir, please do not, if, are you going to drop this egg in the court? Okay, you know, I can't see. I'm you. sorry, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. You may proceed, sir. Now, it makes it difficult for me if I don't stand, Your Honor. Thank you. You can stand now. I just can't see over this bar here, so I can't see what's below your chest area. So you may stand so that way I can see what you're doing, sir. Okay. So Ethan is six feet two, and this is... Less than two feet. That's the human brain. The reason why our brains don't collapse when we have an injury is because the brain is housed in this hard shell called the skull. This skull protects the brain from external injuries. So besides the incident that we saw at the 5-1 diner, did he also make you aware of other circumstances where he hit his head? or even blacked out? Yes. Can you describe that? Yeah, Ethan uh, disclosed that he was out with his parents. I think they were picking strawberries or doing something like that. And and he fell, and all he remembered was coming towards regaining consciousness. And he asked his parents what happened, and they said that he had taken a blow to the head. And there is no indication that he was taken to the emergency room or received medical assistance. In regards to the 5-1 diner video, um, you were shown a report where the owner was interviewed. And in fact, his parents told the owner to not call 911 after that fall. Is that your understanding? Yes, that is correct. And in your interview with Ethan, um, did he ever tell you that at some point following that he was taken to the hospital or taken to the doctor to see one, why he fell, or two, what happened from the fall. I saw no evidence of that. Okay, let's move on. Let's go through a couple of things more quickly. Let's just go to, let's go to part four. So keep clicking. We're gonna move along to part four, which is Ethan's testing. Can you explain to the court the tests that you, um, you performed with Ethan? Certainly, so I uh, 
to form 15 different types of tests. And I wanted to, because there was no opportunity to image his brain, so I wanted to test his brain to see what his brain is like. And so there's, there, there are a list of 15 tests there on the screen that in my report. Okay, let's go through them. Uh, the evaluation of competency to stand trial. Why was this important? It was important because this is a test that is um, affirmed by the, uh, that is recognized, I should say, by the uh, U.S. Supreme Court in um, Dusky versus the people in 1960. And it essentially looks at three things. Does the person have the ability to consult with their attorney? Does the person have the ability to rationally understand the proceedings of the court? Does the person have a factual understanding of the proceedings of the court? And the reason why I administer this test is because I know that sometimes um, inmates feign or they fake. They try to pretend that something is going on when that is not the case. So when I administer this test, anything below 60 is normal, indicating that Ethan approached this test in an honest and open manner. In other words, he was not feigning. He didn't know the questions that pertain to feigning. Okay. Okay. And what were the results? Um, he does have the ability to consult with his attorney. He does understand the charges against him. And he does have a factual understanding of the charges. Okay. Let's move on to the next test, the mini mental status examination. What is that? It's, a, it's a, a test that has essentially 30 questions, and it tests the person's orientation. My reason for administering this is, again, this is one of the instruments that if someone wants to feign or fake, they can easily do that. For example, some of the questions are, what is the date? What is the date? Where are you? And Ethan answered all of those questions indicating on that day that he was oriented times three. Okay. Let's move to the next one. You did a survey of stress symptoms, is that correct? That is correct. Can you explain your findings? So on, on this instrument, uh, on the survey of stress symptoms, um, Ethan scored 39 indicating high levels of stress. And um, it was very clear to me that, 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 that he was approaching it in a very honest, test-taking manner. And can you describe some of the symptoms that this test addresses? Certainly. Anxiety, depression, uh, feeling overwhelmed, overwhelmed, sorry, loneliness, intrusive thoughts, um, fatigue, all of those are elements that are present in this test that he endorsed. Okay. Let's move to the next one, post-traumatic stress checklist for DSM-5. Can you explain what that is? Sure, it's an, it's an instrument that is based on the DSM-5, which is the golden standard of um, diagnosing mental illness. And so his score of 57 places him in a very high stress category that meets the DSM criteria. You then uh, did the Beck Depression Inventory. Can you explain that to the court? Sure, it's an, it's an instrument that uh, assesses for depression, um, uh, sadness, um, um, intrusive thoughts, malaise, um, and this score is 29, which is on that <coughs> higher level indicating very high levels of depression. And again, you're performing these testings at least a year after uh, he has become incarcerated, correct? So that is correct. Let's look at the next one. It's the Burns Anxiety Inventory. Can you explain to the court what that is? So that is a measure of one's anxiety, um, how, how anxious you are as a, as a person. And um, as we know, anxiety has a direct effect on the brain. Um, Ethan's score is 53, which is actually
actually in the highest classification of anxiety. And does that finding of high anxiety um, fit into all of the other evidence you were looking at, the journal, the text messaging between his friend, and what he self-reported to you? That's correct. Let's now look at the brief psychiatric rating scale. Can you explain what that is to the court and what your findings were? Yeah, so this instrument looks at um, psychosis. And what is psychosis? Psychosis is a break from reality, um, as evidenced by um, auditory hallucinations and visual illusions. And um, he endorsed several of those items indicating the presence of psychosis. Okay. Let's now look at the Kaufman Brief Intelligent Test. Can you explain what that is and what your findings were? Yes, uh, the Kaufman Brief Intelligence Test is administered to test someone's um, level of intellectual functioning. The reason why I administered this instrument is I wanted to find out why was he failing in school. In my testing, if you have a very or an intelligent person who's failing in the classroom, it's a signal that there is something going on. And when I administered this test, I saw that his verbal IQ was 104. So average, anything about eight to five, to about 100, 110, falls in the average range. So he has average verbal IQ, average nonverbal IQ, and overall average intelligence. You then went on to perform the wide range achievement test. Can you explain what that is and what your findings were? Certainly, in the state of Michigan for special education testing, you know, we administer the intelligence test and two achievement tests. So I administered a wide range achievement test just to see if I missed anything in terms of his ability to function in their classroom. And except for math, most of his scores were average to high average. Again, that's how we know that there's something else going on with someone who has average intelligence. Okay. Let's move on to the Weschler Individual Achievement Test. Can you explain what that is and what your findings were? So that is the second of the two achievement tests, the RAP and the, and the WIAP. Again, it's just to sort of double check your, your uh, uh, results. Um, and again, the scores are consistent with someone who has the ability academically to function in the classroom, but what? Then finally, the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality mm -hmm. Inventory. What is that and what were your results? So that is, the MMPI is for, and this one is for adolescents. It's regarded as the dean of tests to determine mental illness. Um, this test has been validated across various measures, and it's a test that psychologists use. Um, on the table to the left, um, his, that is his uh, PSY score. His score is 8 to 1. Anything over 60 means that the person has a number of those symptoms. Of mental illness. Of mental illness. Mm -hmm. So his score is 8 to 1 indicating someone who has high degrees of paranoia mm -hmm. and hallucinations. Okay. And then on the right, um, which is even more, more troubling, the uh, table on the right, he has elevations above 60 in two key measures. One is OCD, obsessive, compulsive, and anxiety. And I would love to explain what I mean by that. If you could, if you could explain obsessive compulsive to the court. So there is a part of the brain called the cingulate gyrus. It runs from the front of the brain to the back of the brain. 
That is the brain gear shifter. It allows us to shift from one thing to the next. In Ethan space, someone who scores highly on this measure, what it tells me that this person does not have the ability to shut off those thoughts. It's like being stuck on on. So you're with these thoughts every single day, every single night. And we see that with people who have OCD. He also has very high levels of anxiety. And those two tend to hang together. And as you notice in this journal, you notice that repetition, that I get, the voices don't stop. My brain is on fire. Well, when I tested his brain, it's very consistent with what he was writing. Okay. Does the obsessive compulsive, compulsive disorder explain um, the constant searches on internet to look at violent things or to research things or any type of preparation and planning? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So let's move to the summary of um, the testing results that you performed. Um, do you believe that Ethan is a highly intelligent person? I do. Do you believe that he suffers from debilitating anxiety? I do. Do you believe that he is and was severely depressed? I do. Do you believe that he has features of obsessive compulsive disorder? I do. Were you able to determine that he was failing at school when, as you stated, he shouldn't have been? I did. And what exactly is your diagnosis for Ethan Crumbly? So major depressive disorder, in addition to psychosis, as evidenced by his verbalizing of hearing voices and seeing things. And by the way, about 12.5% of people with major depression experience major depression with psychosis. You have now had an opportunity after turning in your report to review the records from Dr. Kadir. Uh, she is the physician from the Easter Seals. Is that correct? That is correct. Would you agree with me that um, you have similar findings, but not exactly the same? That is correct. Do you have an explanation for that? Yeah, that is not, that is not unusual. Um, diagnosing mental illness um, it's not an exact science, so you go based on symptoms. So, um, Dr. Kadir, based on my review of her notation, diagnosed him with, I think, major depressive disorder and, uh, and I think an adjustment disorder going on with anxiety, with anxiety which, which is not unusual. But I believe as she, as she continues, if she continues to treat him, um, once he has the depression and anxiety under control, if he's still verbalizing, hearing voices and seeing things, then she may add that diagnosis. So it's not inconsistent. Add the diagnosis of psychosis or something else? Correct. Of psychosis. Okay. So you have told us from your results um, that Ethan is of average, if not above average intelligence, correct? Yes, ma'am. So shouldn't he have known better? Shouldn't he have not done this because he's a smart kid? So, unfortunately, intelligence, and this is, this is critical, intelligence does not protect someone from mental illness. So being very intelligent doesn't mean that you cannot be mentally ill. Do you have any real world examples? I do, I do. Um, Robin Williams, very intelligent Hollywood actor, but he was mentally ill. How do I know that? Well, he killed himself. He committed suicide. Um, Twitch, we've seen that publicly, a very talented man on Ellen DeGeneres' uh, show, um, extremely talented. I actually watched, watched a video of him the day before he killed himself. He was dancing with his wife and daughter. And then the next day he drove to a hotel and killed himself. Mental illness is real. Okay. Were you able to watch any videos that were provided to you from body cam footage um, 
of Ethan at the jail. I did. Your Honor, I'm going to play what is in my exhibits as S body cam jail footage. There are a few videos, um, but we have shortened them. This is sound, so I don't know if we can have your staff just make sure the sound is perfect. <laughs>
Someone who's saying, God, why didn't you stop it? And that's exactly how psychosis works. You Wait. engage in an action, and somehow you don't understand the outcome of the consequences. He's having a panic attack and a break with reality. We also hear him saying, you could have saved her. That is correct. In any part of that video, do you see Ethan being violent? No, ma'am. Are mental health issues perfect? I mean, he's obviously been on medication now for a period of time, and things like this obviously can still happen. What is your explanation to that? So medications are not an exact science. There's different levels of titration. There are times when some medications work, and there are times when they don't always work, just like in the physical realm. I want to move on to part five. So you were able to look at the events leading up to the shooting, correct? That is correct. All right. Did Ethan disclose to you um, a situation where he actually brought casings to school and displayed them on his desk? He did. Can you explain that? Certainly. Um, he indicated to me that he brought one light round, and actually in my review of the records and with the detective that interviewed some of the students, one of the students did confirm that Ethan showed him a light round and shell casing. So I have no reasons to doubt what he said, that he placed some shell casings on the desk in his class, and the teacher walked by, didn't name the teacher, and I said to him multiple times, are you sure? And he said yes. You were made aware and you were able to see some interviews about the events of November 30th in the counseling office, correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, and it was your understanding that he was caught looking at websites dealing with ammunition? That is correct. Okay. Were you able to look at the actual school assignment that was the cause of him being taken to the office that morning where he wrote certain things and drew certain things. That is correct. Were you also able to discuss with Ethan um, the video that the court has been shown that was filmed the night before? Yes, ma'am. And you've had an opportunity to review that video? I have. Can you explain that video or give it some context? So this was a night before the shooting when Ethan recorded himself. He appeared to have been using a cell phone in terms of what he was planning to do the following day. And in certain parts of the video, um, he made references to, to demons. And then in the video he said, I am the demon. It, it just indicates the, the fragmentation in his head in terms of what was happening. Okay. 
And what was your understanding about why he was outside at that point in time? What did he tell you had gone on in the home leading up to him being outside? I think his parents had locked him out of the house um, and he had taken some, some money from him. Okay. And was that in relation to grades? Yes, because he was failing some of his classes. And how did he feel about that? Um, terrible um, in terms of how they were treating him. The video um, that the court has viewed, and I know you have viewed, it, it seems just like a rambling of thoughts. That is correct, okay. just sort of scrambled thoughts. And do you believe that that is part of what mental illness can do to you? Yes, ma'am. Let's talk about the actual day of the shooting. Um, did Ethan ever tell you if he had been asked if he had a gun by any school professionals or the, the parents that day at school? No. And is it your understanding um, from speaking to Ethan that he was allowed to stay in school that day? Yes, he was allowed to stay in school. And can you explain the situation involving his backpack or how he explained it to you? So this is how he explained it to me after he was called down to the office, he left his backpack in the classroom. And then he indicated that, I think it was Ejac, I could be butchering his name, I do apologize for that, went to get his, to retrieve his backpack. And Ethan said, for the first time in his life, he felt relieved. He said he just knew that the sheriffs were going to burst into the office and arrest him because there was no way, after all that they saw, that they were not going to search that backpack. In fact, this is a comment he made that has stuck with me. He said one of the Hispanic students was suspected of using drugs. And he remembered them searching that kid's locker. And he felt fairly sure that they were going to search his backpack. When Ejac brought the backpack into the office, he made a comment. He said, this is heavy. What do you have in here? Bricks? And then Ethan said, all he had to do was just unzip that backpack. But he didn't. So the best of your knowledge, after speaking with Ethan and reviewing all of the records, the backpack was not searched, correct? It was not searched. So obviously at that point, Ethan had the opportunity to volunteer the information that he had a weapon in his bag. Would you agree with me? That is correct. Can you explain why you believe that did not happen? He was in a state of ambivalence. <laughs> do I tell? Do I not tell? Do I do this? Do I not do this? What is going to happen if I tell? So that's the state of flux that he was in. So I want to kind of put it all together for the court. So you've told us about a complex childhood full of trauma, correct? That is correct. Violence in the home. That is correct. Mental illness. That is correct. A lack of resources. No one's getting him the counseling that he needs. That is correct. Neglect. That is correct access to weapons that is correct in a school system with not enough counselors that and where did that lead us a tragedy. i want to move on to part six i know you've touched on quite a bit of this already there's been testimony and there's been um, some argument about ethan looking up or talking about going to prison is it normal that a 15-year-old would just be okay with the fact 
that he's going to do something that lands him in prison. So teenagers go through a phase that is called personal failure. And if I may give you an example. Sure. A teenager may be driving 100 yards away, the light is about to turn red. They think that they can magically beat that red light and nothing bad is going to happen to them. It's because their brain, their prefrontal cortex, this is the brain supervisor, mm -hmm. is not fully developed. Just biologically, physiologically, the human brain, the prefrontal cortex, is not developed until about age 24, 25. In Ethan's case, he had what is called arrested development. Can you explain what that is? Absolutely. So chronologically, he may have been 15 at the time, but given the high levels of stress and complex trauma, his age was much younger than his chronological age. You've been able to see through the text messages and actually in your interviews with Ethan, he reported that he was not sleeping and he was not eating. How does that tie into mental illness? So the brain consumes about 20 to 30% of the calories that we consume. So whatever we consume, the brain consumes about 20 to 30% of that. So sleep deprivation and lack of uh, appropriate nutrition greatly impact the body. Our bodies were not meant to be in a state of high anxiety perpetually. You've also been able to take a look at the Google searches that he was do doing, and a lot of them are looking kind of for self-diagnosis, looking up what is depression. Um, do I have ADHD? Do I have obsessive compulsive disorder? What do you make of that? So here is a child who was just trying to, to make sense of his inner world. He couldn't get help from his parents in the home system. He couldn't get help from the school system. He couldn't get to a doctor. He couldn't get to a counselor. So his last resort was to try to figure out what, what's happening to me. Is this, is this normal? Um, am I depressed? Am I anxious? Am I a sociopath? Who am I? He's trying to make sense of what's going on within him. You've also been shown a number of searches that were, do were done on a particular website where very violent videos, actual murders, actual shootings um, are, are categorized and, and people can view them. What is your understanding of what that does, especially to an adolescent's brain? So during adolescence, the, the, the person's brain, brain is still in the formative stage. The neurons are still trying to connect. And if one spends an inordinate amount of time ingesting that type of content without supervision, before long, it's natural to lose sight of what is real and what is not real. Now, you've been made aware that there was a situation at the jail um, with a password and a tablet, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And can you explain what you believe to have happened um, in this situation? Certainly. So, Ethan was given um, a tablet. And because he's an, a fairly intelligent person, he was able to figure out the password and was able to go on the internet and use his uh, tablet. And what he indicated to me is that although he had the urge to go to the, to the live door site, he was able to restrain himself, which he's pretty proud of, two weeks just did not go to the site, um, but he eventually went there. And what does that 
Can you give that a context? What does that mean to you? Is he regressing? What, can you give an explanation to that? So when you make a comparison of what he was doing prior, he was ingesting that content constantly, every day, hours and hours at a time. And in my mind, it shows progress, not perfection, but progress. Were you able to view uh, the videos of Ethan killing baby birds? I did. Can you discuss the significance of that and what you think and how you think it fits into this case and his diagnosis? Absolutely. Um, I observed um, Ethan um, torturing baby birds. He wanted them to feel the pain that he was feeling inside. And I observed his persona. Um, he was actually speaking to them in a different tone of voice, almost as a parent talking to a child. It's just a reflection of, of his, his mental impairment. What about, um, he talks about a desire to kill or he wants to find another set of baby birds so that he can kill them. Can you explain that? It sort of lines up with my testing of his brain. Um, I indicated that his obsessive compulsive um, scales, I think this goes A to one, indicating that this part of the brain, the cingulate gyrus is on fire meaning that it's hard to turn it off and without appropriate intervention, without treatment and medications, that part of the brain is stuck on the phone. What about the fact that when the police come in, Ethan surrenders, um, and then in the police car acts normal? I mean, he's not, he's not talking to voices, he's not flailing about. Can you explain that? Certainly, it's a it's a uh, um, a phase called tension reduction. So tension is something that is built up. Anxiety, obsession, anxiety, obsession. I guess a good analogy is to uh, think in terms of like a, a pressure cooker. It's on the stove and it's boiling, and there's tension building up in there. And the one way for that tension to go away is when you release that now, the tension goes out and you revert to equilibrium. So tension reduction, tension reduction cycle. So is your explanation then, once he carried out this plan that he was so fixated on, <clears throat> he had that sense of reduction or accomplishment? Absolutely. It's <laughs> Um, analogous to what we just witnessed. So the person in the videos is the same person in the courtroom. There's no difference. It is the same person. I want to talk about the report that you authored. Um, obviously, in giving the history that you did, you've been doing these regular types of analysis outside of the courtroom for many years. You would agree with me? That is correct. Okay. So how is it that you came to start doing the work that you're doing now for Miller hearings? It was so in, I think it was around uh, 2019, an attorney reached out to me and, um, and asked me if I would do one of the Miller hearings. Mm -hmm. And I was fairly confident in my ability as a psychologist, um, in my ability to clinically interview someone, in my ability to test someone. But in terms of crafting a legal report, I was a neophyte. It was not my area of expertise. And so I reached out to the attorney and said that if I'm to do this this report. 
I'm going to need you to reach out to your sources, obtain copies of their report, make sure you get their permission, um, because I plan to use uh, the uh, rubric and extract some of the legal language in my report. And that is 2019 to 20, 25 clients ago. And that is the exact format that I've been using. And that's what you did in this case? Yes, ma'am. Were you able to form an opinion whether or not Ethan Crumbly was mentally ill on November 30th of 2021? Yes, ma'am. And what is that? Um, he has major depressive disorder with psychosis, anxiety, and features of obsessive compulsive disorder. He is mentally ill. And in all of the testing that you did and the interviews, do you believe that there is the possibility of rehabilitation? I do. And can you explain that? Certainly. Um, as I indicated, um, I've worked in the field of brain injury for 25 years. I take pride in my work. I've treated people with stroke, CBA. I've tre treated people with anoxic brain injury and I've treated people with mental health. And along with my team, we've been able to rehabilitate people. A number of my clients have had uh, issues with the law and through psychotherapy and support, they've made progress. Additionally, and this is important, in neuroscience, there is something called neuroplasticity. And that is the ability of the brain to create new pathways, to generate new neurons. You see this in stroke victim, mm -hmm. the stroke on the left hand side, this right hand side, you black. Well, those are the people that I've worked with and taught them how to speak again and how to walk again and how to function. So absolutely yes. So people with mental illness, especially ones that do something you know, extremely serious that, le that leads them down a path that they find themselves in prison. I know Dr. Keating touched on this a little bit, but you believe that, especially based on Ethan's age, that his brain can rewire and he can stop the behaviors that he was exhibiting previously. Is that correct? That is correct. Ethan's brain is still maturing, um, and his brain probably will not reach full maturity for another 10 years. Are the clinical opinions in your report based solely on the testing and your interaction with Ethan Crumbly that you yourself perform? So my conclusions are based on my clinical interview of Ethan Crumbly and are based on the results from my testing. I have no further questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Your Honor, uh, the doctor has actually testified to a whole lot of things that are not in his report. And could we take a short break before cross examination? Sure. We'll go ahead and take about a 10 minute break. Deputies, if you could go ahead and take the defendant back downstairs. To those in the gallery, please be seated until the defendant is exited. Sir, you may please step down. Thank you. We will stand in recess for about 10, 10 15 minutes. Court stands in recess. All right. <laughs>
Thank you. 
It's on it's his first report. And then the other one is Anaker's report. Which he relied on. Oh, and I may not you'll see I may not introduce it, but I have the report from which he took the language.
Some of the things that Kim said in here was like, that's her again. I think it's like, I'm thinking, I think, half hour ish. You all need to see that. Your Honor, calling People versus Ethan Tumley, case number 279506FC. Thank you. Appearances for the record. Karen McDonald on behalf of the people. Thank you, Mark. He's on behalf of the people. Good afternoon, Your Honor. David Williams on behalf of the people. Call up Michelle Lofton on behalf of Ethan Tumley. Amy Cobb on behalf of Ethan Tumley. Deborah Schmidt on behalf of Ethan Thank you. You all may be seated. And good morning again. Dr. King, if he's still in the room. Dr. King, you may retake the stand, sir. Sir, you may be seated. You are still under oath. Good morning, Dr. King. Good morning, sir. Dr. King, you're here because your job is to help the defense establish mitigating factors for this defendant, correct? Yes, sir. And you're familiar with the Miller factors? Yes, sir. Okay. And in fact, you note that on the first page of your report, the defendant was referred to you for an evaluation focused particularly on the sentencing factors outlined in Miller versus Alabama, correct? Yes, sir. 
And then you say that the Miller factors and mental illness, you say supports a sentence of other than life without parole, true? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, you know that the Miller factors are incorporated into Michigan law. Do you, are you aware of that? Yes, sir. Okay, and can you tell us what the five factors are? So, uh, immaturity, age, recognized as a young, 18, impetuosity, transience or recklessness, and ability to extricate oneself from a, a dysfunctional family. <coughs> Anything else, doctor? I probably missed a couple. I didn't memorize them. Okay, so doctor, in fact, under the law, there are five factors. Uh, first is chronological age, hallmark features among them, immaturity, impetuosity, failure to appreciate risks and consequences. Does that sound right? That sounds right. So most of what you described goes to that first factor. The second is the juvenile's family and home environment. Uh, and you talked about that, the inability to, um, to overcome his circumstances, right? Yes, sir. There are three other factors, the circumstance of the homicide offense, the incompetencies of youth, which affect how the juvenile might have been charged or convicted of a lesser crime, and the possibility of rehabilitation, correct? Yes, sir. All right. Doctor, when were you retained in this case? I think it was contacted on or around, and my, my timelines could be off. I want to say in November, so just around Thanksgiving, of 22, I believe. Again, my timeline could be off. And you were provided some materials to review? Yes, sir. And then you interviewed the defendant? I did. Over how many sessions? I believe over six sessions. And can you tell us when those were? Sir, I did not memorize the date. I think the first time I met the uh, defendant would have been around January or the fifth, I think that is the first time I interviewed him. Um, I interviewed him twice virtually and maybe three or four times after the last time I interviewed him was probably July, I think 10th or 11th. I don't have the access to my calendar, so I didn't memorize those two. So doctor, what do you have with you today? Before you move on, the first meeting you said that was in on January 4th or January 5th, was that of 2023? Yes, sir. Thank you. And then your last meeting, of course, would have been in 2023 as well, sir? Yes, sir. Thank you. You may proceed. Thank you. Um, doctor, what do you have with you today? I have my PowerPoint. For at least a minute, then let it cool. Boiled or bottled water should be used in drinking, making ice, washing dishes, and preparing food until further notice. Well, I went to the just the one store at Meyer at 23 and Gratiot, but as soon as I walked in, he said, we're out of water. <laughs> so I called work and I said, well, try BJ's. They usually have more anyway. Crews from the Great Lakes Water Authority are now working to isolate and investigate this bothersome break so it can be repaired and the water pressure restored to communities like Macomb and Chesterfield Townships and beyond. Until that happens, though, area stores will be a popular place and bottled water, the most popular item on many shopping lists. It's uh, it's not worth getting upset about. Yeah, life goes on. So, Dr. King, you have your report in front of you? I do. And so we're clear that's your report dated June 16, 2023, and you signed it on page 69, correct? I do. All right. If you turn to page three, doctor, does that help refresh your recollection regarding any of the dates that you interviewed the defendant? I do. Okay, so was your first meeting with him on December 15th of 2022? 
That is correct. And you uh, conducted a structured interview on January 5th, 2023. That is correct. And you did a, an evaluation of competency to stand trial on, November, on January 11th of 2023. That is correct. Okay. And, and as to the other three dates, you're not able to give us those today. Yes, that is correct. And doctor, you did some testing and then you did some research yourself, correct? That is correct. Doctor, in the timeline that, that was in the presentation that was put up on the screen, it didn't include the dates of your reports. You actually you prepared two reports, correct? I prepared an initial report because if my memory serves me correctly, this hearing was supposed to have been held, I think, early in May. May 1st. May 1st. And then I was told that there was an adjournment, and, um, and so here we are today. Right, okay, so, but in your timeline, it didn't include the dates of the reports, and in fact, the first report came partway through that timeline, would you agree? And then the last report came in June. That sounds about right, sir. So, doctor, on page three of your report, again, we're talking about your June report, uh, you refer to it on page two as a complete list of records relied on and reviewed, correct? What, it, what page is that? On page two, you reference, it's in the first paragraph, about partway down, a complete list of records reviewed and relied on is listed beginning on page three of this report. I see that. Okay. And then you see um, on page three of your report, you list a number of things, correct? That is correct, sir. Dr. King, you testified to a number of, of things on direct that don't appear in that list. Can you... Um, tell us what those are. What other things that aren't on this list you reviewed and considered? So, for instance, um, <clears throat> Dr. Kadir's um, report from Easter Seals, which is comprised of 1,310 pages. I believe I only got those, I think, last week. Okay. Um, and uh, Ms. Lofton, um, of course, has sent me updated information. I apologize. I've not been able to memorize information. We're talking about voluminous pages of information. Okay, so what I want to know about, Doctor, is things that you had at the time of your June 16th report that you did not list. So, for example, you said in your direct testimony that you interviewed a neighbor. You recall testifying to that? Yes. And that's not listed in your source of information, is it? <coughs> that is not listed. I, I do not see that. Okay, in fact, when did you conduct that interview? Probably was about, I think about two months ago, and again, my timeline could be off. I did not, I don't have my talent in front of me, sir, so I'm not able to give you that exact date. Doctor, you made no reference to that in your report, did you? It's not in my source of available information. Is it referenced anywhere in your report? I don't see the reference here, sir. Okay, but I, I'm not, there are a bunch of things you referenced that aren't listed in your sources, and we'll talk about that. What I'm asking you is, did you make reference to your interview with the neighbor anywhere in your report? Is there any way I would have known that about that before today? Yes, yeah, so um, can I explain? Please. So you have, sir, a copy of my PowerPoint? No, sir, I don't. Okay, I apologize for that. So... It's not mentioned in your report. Did you document that interview with the neighbor in any way? I did. And do you have that documentation with you today? It's not in my report, sir. Okay, thank you. Do you have documentation of that anywhere? Do you have notes? Do you have, did you write a short report? Did you report that to counsel? Do you have anything that reflect your interview with the neighbor? Yes, sir. Okay. Do you have that with you today? I do not. 
Doctor, you also referenced text messages between the parents, right? Yes, sir. And that's not listed in your source of information either, is it? It is not listed. Okay. And you don't reference that in the report, do you? That is correct. Okay. Doc, you testified about reviewing the defendant's internet searches, correct? That is correct. And in fact, you mentioned something about researching something about a dog, right? About bearing the dog. That is correct. Okay. You talked about he's he's got to go out to the shed and bury the dog, right? That is correct. Sir. And he was he was researching how to do that. That is correct. And that's the same shed where he tortured the baby birds, correct? I don't know that to be a fact, but if you say that is the case, I don't know that to be a fact. So, Doctor, you you have something that no one else in this courtroom has. You had access to all the information you wanted, and you got to interview the defendant. Did you not ask the defendant about where that torture took place? The torture of? The birds. I think he said it took place in the shed. I don't know if there's you know, multiple sheds. I've never been to the home, sir, so I honestly don't know. So, Doctor, I, I just asked you about the torture, and then you said the torture of what? Are you aware of torture of, of anything other than birds? I just wanted to have clarification from you, sir, just before I answer the question. That's fine. Are you aware of any other torture committed by the defendant? Besides the birds, I don't think so. Or at least I don't recall of any other. Doctor, you also mentioned that you reviewed text messages over a period of months between the defendant and his friend B. Is that right? Is that your testimony? Yes, sir. In your report, doctor, you, you reference a subset of those, right? Do you have a page for me? So, doctor, you can do two things. One is, why don't we look at page three, the fifth bullet point up from the bottom, and you list a series of dates. Text messages obtained by Paulette Lofton between the defendant and his friend B dated April 5th, 2021 to April 7th of 2021, right? Okay. But you're telling the court you, in fact, viewed, reviewed a lot more text than that. You just don't reference them in your sources, correct? That is true. Okay. And then, doctor, on pages 8 through 22, 8 through 21, uh, you include a series of text messages. Do you know about how many those are? How many text messages? Yeah, that you include in your report. Oh. If I say roughly 200, I don't need an exact number. Does that sound about right? I would not disagree with you. Okay. And, Doc, you'd agree with me, those text messages that you specifically paste into your report are all from one day, one day, April 5th of 2021. As far as I can see, sir, yes. Um, Doctor, you looked at some some emails, um, and then you looked at something assignment from Ms. Kubina uh, that you referenced. Those also are not listed in your source of information, are they? They are not. But you did review them and consider those? I did. And then Dr. Dr. Anaker's report is listed in your sources, correct? That is correct, sir. And you reviewed that entire report, correct? The report of Dr. Anaker? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. And you considered that in your analysis. It was part of your review and your conclusion. Is that correct? I did. So, Doctor, we talked about uh, the text message you reviewed. Uh, you also reviewed some videos, correct? Yes, sir, I did. And what videos did you review? I reviewed the videos of the um, actual shooting. I reviewed the videos of the, of the bird and uh, the video of Ethan taking a fall in the diner, and 
I believe, four or five other videos from the Oakland County Jail. Okay, and Doctor, do you also review the, the video that the defendant took the night before the shooting? Yes, I did. Doctor, regarding the diner video, I, when I watch it, it doesn't seem you can see in the video whether the defendant hits his head or not. Are you, were you able to see that in the video or did you get that from the defendant? Can you rephrase that question, please, sir? When I watched the video from the diner, I actually didn't see the defendant hit his head. Maybe I missed it. But are you saying you can see that in the video or that that's what the defendant told you? I'm wondering if you missed it, sir, because based on my, my review of it, that is what appeared to have happened. And he was helped up and then fell again and had to be helped up. That's how I saw it. You prepared. We talked about two reports, doctor, and the first report is dated January 27th of 2023. You know, may, may I approach, Your Honor? Yes. <clears throat> doctor, I'm showing you a remark of People's Proposed Exhibit 63. Can you take a look at that? One moment, please. Doctor, I'll go through that with you a little bit, but does that look like your previous report? It does. I do have an updated report, June 16th. So these two, this is an updated of what I did initially. Correct. So I received two copies of your report. The first one is the one you're looking at now, Exhibit 63, and the other is the June 16th report. And that sounds right to you. You did two reports. Yes, sir. Okay. And, and you agree this is the first one? Yes, so I'm a little confused because I, I'm under the impression that the June 16th report supersedes the January 7th report because uh, the June 16th report has information that I didn't have when I did the January report. Okay, that's important, Doctor. It's information you didn't have, and we're going to talk about that. All right, doctor, are there differences between the two report, two reports? Yes, sir, there, there are differences. Okay, can you tell me what those are? <clears throat> you know what, doctor, I wanna step back for one second. Let me withdraw that question, we'll come back to that. Do you know when that report was finalized? Because it was, it's dated January 27th, 2023. I didn't receive it until April. Do you know when you finalized that version? Sir, I'm not able to keep that timeline in my head. I apologize that I can't memorize the timeline that the report was completed, sir. So, doctor, I'm not worried about memorizing the timeline. I'm just asking if you know about when this. So, so you agree you were going to testify on about May 1st for the Miller King one was originally scheduled, correct? Yes, sir. That is correct. So did you complete your first report in January, a few months before the Miller hearing, or did you finish it in April or sometime in between? I know it was completed before May 1st, but exactly when, I don't know, sir. Okay, a couple of weeks before? Okay. Okay, so when you submitted that report at that time, you thought that was your final report and you were gonna to come to court and testify on May 1st with that report, correct? That was my understanding, sir. And at that point, uh, you've been retained since you think November, right? I was contacted in November, and I believe I was retained shortly after. Okay, and you know you were retained by December 15th because you were meeting with the defendant by then, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And at that point, doctor, had you been given access to everything you needed or you wanted to see for your report? I was given access to information. I don't know that I was given access to everything because obviously since then, I've been given additional information. Okay. And at that point, doctor, if you look at your your first, or your the partial paragraph, uh, 
at the bottom of page one of the January report said you'd spent 16 hours interviewing the defendant, correct? That is correct. Okay, and then after you submitted that report, uh, this hearing was adjourned, right? That is correct. And then you spent about another six hours with the defendant in your June report, it says you've spent now 22 hours with them. Does that sound right? That sounds about right. All right, doctor, I asked you about the differences in the report. Can you go over those with me? Are you asking me to tell you the differences in these two reports? Yes, sir. Yes. Gotcha. I'm not sure if you want me to go through page by page. So the yeah, yeah. first report has six to nine pages. And I think my, uh, the, the, uh, your second groups. report also has 69 pages. Right? six to nine pages. So what, what what parts do you want to go through first? I'd like to know what you changed between the January report and the June report. All right, so doctor, as you sit here right now, you're not able to quickly tell me what changed. Yeah, we're looking at almost 70 pages, so uh, single space. It will take me a long time to compare the, these two reports and go through line by line by line. Would you agree, doctor, there, there are not a lot of differences. Would you agree with me? I am not able to answer that question, sir, I, because I don't know the answer. Okay, but they're both your reports, doctor, and you had an additional couple of months when the hearing was adjourned to prepare another report right? Yes, sir. And you're saying you don't remember what you did in addition to your first report to come to your second report. What I am saying is that between May, for instance, between May and July, I have met with um, uh, Ethan Thompson. You spent another six hours with him, right? So, doctor, look at, look at the... Before you move on, did you meet with him for six hours through May and July? Approximately. So, doctor, uh, I want you to look at page one of your June report, and I want you to look at the second sentence. It starts on December 1st, 2021. The defendant was booked at the Oakland County Jail after bringing a nine millimeter handgun to Oxford High School, where he allegedly shot and killed four of his classmates. Do you see that? Are you reading from the January report? June report, Doctor. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? Yes. I want you to look at the June report and see that you said that the defendant allegedly shot and killed four of his classmates in June. Do you see that? Yes, sir. And in fact, in your January report, you, you don't say allegedly. Can you tell the court why you changed it to say that he allegedly killed four students? I don't know that why that was changed, sir. No one has ever told you that this defendant did not kill those four students, correct? That is correct. You know that he did it, but for some reason you made a change to say that he allegedly did it, but you don't know why. That is correct, sir. All right, doctor, I'm looking, now we're going to go back to the January report. I want to look at page three of the January report, and I want to look at the items you considered. Your sources of available information. So we're in the January report. I'm looking at the last bullet point. Um, Judge, I'm sorry, I don't know if I gave you a copy of people's proposed exhibit 63. May I do that? Yes, are you moving to admit it at this time? Before yes, sure. Any objections? No objections. Thank you. Plaintiff 63 is admitted. You may approach. Thank you. 
All right, so doctor, we're looking at the last bullet point on Exhibit 63, the January report, and the last bullet point, can you, can you read that to us? On the uh, January 27th itself, that is dated January 27th, the last bullet point says, Oakland County Prosecutor's Office video footage. Correct, and you list three videos, correct? I do. And what are those? All right, Doctor, now I'd like you to turn to page three of your June report. I also have a June report. Okay, and the last bullet point, what does the last bullet point in the June report say? It says, Oakland County Deputies Body Camera Footage. And in that regard, you're talking about the body camera footage from the jail that we saw on the screen, correct? Okay, I think so. Okay, um, he's wearing the spit hood over his head and he, they've got him in a chair, he's upset? That is correct. All right. So, doctor, you did, in fact, view the Oxford High School video of the November 30th, 2021 shooting, the bird video recorded by Ethan, and the manifest manifesto video recorded by Ethan, right? You you had access to those, and you reviewed those, correct? Correct. That is correct. And then you just took them out of your June report? I don't know that I took them out. Um, Doctor, you're welcome to as much time as you want, but if you look at that list on page three, those videos are not referenced. Yes, they're not listed there. Okay, so you took them out, and my question to you is why? Some of them are not listed there. And my question to you, doctor, is why aren't they listed? Why did you take them out between your two reports? I'm not sure why. But you agree with me, you watched those before your January report. Can you repeat the question, please? You watched those videos before you submitted your January report. So when you listed them in your sources, in your January report, you had in fact reviewed them. That is correct. Doctor, on page 49 of your June report. So page 49 of your June report under events leading up to the shooting. Do you see that? Yes, sir. And you, you referenced the journal that the defendant kept. Do you see that? You mean page 49? Yes. So first line, the first line under events leading up to the shooting. Yes, sir. When did you review the journal? Yes. I don't have the date in front of me, sir. Well, when did you receive it from counsel? I don't have that exact date in front of me, sir. I do not know the date. I want to jump ahead to page 68 of your January report. I look at conclusion events. Again, we're on page 68. Do you see that? One moment, sir. Yes. And Doctor, the last sentence, I'm sorry, the second to last sentence under conclusion events says, surveillance video shows the defendant sitting on the ground crying 
fully well knowing that he is on a path of no return. You see that? Yes, sir. That's not in your June report, is it? It's page 68 of your June report. It's at the top. It's conclusion events, and that sentence is taken out, isn't it? On the June report? Correct. It says, surveillance video shows Ethan sitting on the ground crying, fully well knowing that he's on a path of no return. That's in your January report, correct? That is correct. But not in your June report, correct? I actually just read that from my June report. And doctor, you and I have two different reports. Can I see what you're looking at, Doctor? Certainly. Give me a couple weeks. Thank you. I have a copy of the report that's in my exhibit. I don't know if you could give us a copy. Not in the June report. Your Honor, may I approach and provide my client with a copy of the report that is contained in my exhibit? I don't know if the report that he's referencing is another edit that was done, um, but I have the copy that was submitted to the people and that was submitted to the court. He was not provided that copy today, so I don't know if he's looking at another version. And I'll, and I'll just indicate for the record, Your Honor, he showed me a, a report that's dated June 16th, but the language is not the same. Thank you. Are there multiple copies of the June report? Your Honor, this was a working document, and I, I know Dr. King can explain that. Obviously, since the first report, which was turned over to the people in April, a number of things have transpired, and he has continued to work and continue to edit his report so that the report that the court has today is the most accurate report. Um, so if I could approach with the exhibit that was turned over to uh, the people as well as the court to make sure that we are all looking at the exact same version of this report that is ever changing. Thank you. He should only have the report before him that has been admitted into evidence. This so is the report. Whatever's been admitted into evidence, Doctor, that's the only report that you are testifying to. Um, please don't testify to reports that have not been admitted into evidence because it causes confusion. You may approach the witness and give him the exhibit that has been admitted into evidence. Thank you. Okay. And what's the date of this exhibit? It is the June 16th report. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You may proceed. Thank you. Your Honor, may I approach? I'd like to see what he brought to try and understand why there are two reports with the same date. I'm just going to say to my approach. You may. May I yes. also approach? Yes, absolutely. Just wants to take a moment to prepare. All right, so so first, Dr. King, I want to make sure we're, we've cleared this up. So you came to court today and brought a, a third version of your report that is, in fact, dated June 16th, but is not the final version. Is that correct? So as uh, Attorney explained to us, this has been a work in progress that I emailed and sent over and updated. Mm -hmm. So there seems to be some confusion as to what, which one is current. I've been handed the copy of what I think has been admitted into, into evidence, and that's what I'm referencing. And now, Doctor, I'm going to bring back to you the, the one that you brought with you to court today. And what I'd like you to do is now turn to the report that's been admitted as an exhibit, the June 16th report that's in evidence.
And if you flip to page 68, okay, and if you look at conclusion events, <clears throat> you see that the sentence I referenced in your January 27th, 2023 report, and that's still in the report you brought with you, is in fact not in the report that was provided to me and that's in evidence today. You see that? That is correct. Okay. Doctor, where did that come from? The, the statement that surveillance video shows the defendant sitting on the ground crying fully well knowing that he's on a path of no return. Where did you get that? I had an opportunity to um, view the um, video of him sitting in the lunchroom, the cafeteria. <clears throat> So, Doctor, that's your interpretation of a video of the defendant. You say he's crying. Okay. There's no audio? There's no audio. Did you ask the defendant about that? I did not. All right. So, Doctor, between the first report and the second report, we're going to say you've got about two months more to, uh, time to work on it, correct? That is correct. And based on everything you reviewed and your discussions with the defendant and, and with his defense team, you identified all of the in, all of the mitigating information you could find, correct? That is correct. And you included the mitigating information you found in your report, correct? That is correct. And in fact, that was the whole point. That's why you're retained is to find as much mitigation as you could and then present that to the court in a report and then come testify about it, right? That's correct. And doctor, uh, you were given sufficient time to meet with the defendant and consult with defense counsel, right? That's correct. And you weren't rushed in doing your report? I don't think I was. Okay. And if you felt there was some more mitigating information out there in the world, like you talked to the neighbor, if you thought there was something else, you would have looked into that, correct? That's correct. Was there anything, doctor, that you saw referenced? in anything that was provided to you or that you learned from the defendant and you said, you know what, I, I haven't seen that. I would like to see that. Anything that you wanted to see that was not provided to you. Okay, correct. I'm asking you, was there anything in addition to what you have that you said, I would like to see something else that was not provided to you? Were you given everything you asked for? As far as I, um, I'm aware of. All right, doctor, we're going to spend some time on your June 16th report. But before we review that, um, doctor, did you listen to the testimony presented by the prosecution last Thursday and Friday? I did. Okay. And you've never spoken to any of the investigators in this case before, correct? I have not. Okay. And you've not spoken to Keegan or Heidi or Ms. Gibson Marshall or Ms. Darnell, the, the witnesses who testified who were in the school, right? You've never spoken with them? I have not. Okay. So when you heard their testimony, doctor, did that, have, did that have any impact whatsoever on your opinion? It hasn't changed my opinion. Okay. All right, doctor. So now I'm going to focus on your June report and I want to turn to page four. And in the section under Ethan family tree and early influence, you repre represent ACEs, right? We're on page four of the June report. That is correct. All right. And doctor, uh, you don't reference the study that you're talking about there. You provide a footnote at the bottom, but it doesn't give me a, a journal or a place to find that specific report. Do you have a site for that with you? Can you rephrase that, please? I'm not sure what you're asking me. All right. So if you look at your footnote two on page four, you talk about the adverse childhood experiences study child abuse and public health, but there's no citation. You list some authors, but I wasn't able to find that specific report. Do you have a citation, some way to find that specific report? So just for clarification, in my testing, the ACEs consist of 10 questions. And the 
more aces that are present, the more the probability exists that this person is going to have issues. In my more than 16 hours of interviewing Stephen, I obtained the ACES information from him. So if you're asking me, did I administer the, the ACES? There was no need to. Okay, but the question is for this footnote, do you have a specific citation for this footnote that would help uh, aid in trying to find this other person? The citation is listed there where it says the adverse childhood experience study and um, the author, Dr. Robert Panda, from the Center for Disease Control. And what I'm telling you, doctor, is I, I Googled that. I tried to look it up, but without a citation, I was not able to find that specific report. And I'm asking you if you have a citation so I could reference the exact report you're referring to. This is what I looked at, sir, in terms of the uh, ACES coming out of the CDC. Do you have a copy of that, doctor? The report you're referencing in footnote two? I don't have a copy with me. I looked at the study coming out of the CDC and Kaiser pertaining to the ACES. So, doctor, I think this was in your slide, but that study looked at the adverse health effect on the child, right? In this case, the defendant, not on... So the, the things they would experience later in life because of the ACEs, right? That is correct. Health effects and heart problems and stress and all these things, right? That is correct. The reason I'm asking you for the study is because in your description on paragraph four, your, you say that, that ACEs culminate in numerous antisocial activities such as aggressive acts, unwarranted violence, and heinous crimes. And I couldn't find that anywhere in relation to ACEs. And I'm asking you, where do you get that from? Sure. Sir, if you were to uh, research and look at the um, information surrounding the ACEs study, I think it was conducted in uh, 95 and 97. My dates could be off of 17,000 subjects. There is a litany of information in terms of what happens to someone who possesses uh, the X amount of ACEs. And so the problem is, doctor, you can't give me that report. You can't cite that to me so I can question you about that. Okay. <clears throat> so, doctor, you talked about a 10, 10 question survey. And in fact, uh, you didn't, you just said you didn't need to score them. You, you didn't attempt to score them, did you? I did not administer the ACEs because I administered 15 psychological tests that provided me the information I needed to reference the ACEs. All right, doctor. So you say there's studies out there that, that can trace an ACEs score to other effects, but you didn't need to give it to trace it to other effects. You had other testing. You don't need ACEs. That's your testing. I got that information from testing even over 15 different tests and screening measures. All right. And so um, how hard is it to give someone an ACEs score? Ask the 10 questions. Actually, it's not difficult at all. Okay, but you didn't do it. There was no need to. All right, and you agree with me that, in fact, you need a score of six or more to be predictive. That was your testimony on direct, correct? So what I said was six or more can predict. It's, it's a predictor. It's not a precise screening measure that this person will have these type of problems. Doctor, you relied largely on the defendant's self-reporting for a lot of your analysis, correct? No, that is not correct. Okay, let me ask you this. You're aware that he has said that he was not bullied, right? You're yes. aware that he said that? That is correct. And that he thinks that he had an okay home life, right? That's his opinion. That's his opinion. Right? Um, you know that he didn't suffer any sexual abuse, right? <clears throat> I'm not aware of that, sir. Hmm? Physical abuse? That is debatable. Okay. So, Dr. Can you, as you sit here today, can you tell the court that in fact, this defendant has a score of six or higher on ACEs? Absolutely. All right, so you can score him on ACEs right now. 100%. Sir. Okay, let's do that. Absolutely. Take me through the testing, take me through the 10 questions and let's talk about his score. So I don't have the question in front of me, but I can ask some of the questions to get the information to that question. I'll be happy to walk you through. Okay, please. Okay. Um, you want to ask about um, 
Dr. Soborg Claire, I don't care what you want to ask about. I want you to tell me the defendant's ACEs score. That's what I want to know. You said you didn't do it, you didn't need to, but now I want to know what his score is. So I was very clear with you that I administered 15 tests, and I said I did not administer the ACEs. I was very clear about that. You did, and then you just told me you could do it right now. I said I can give him an ACEs score based on the 15 tests that I administered. All right, doctor. So why don't you give me his ACEs score based on the 15 tests you administered? So his score will probably range somewhere between six to about eight. And that's based on the other tests that you gave him? Yes, sir. And that's not anywhere in your report, you agree? I did not administer the ACEs. Doctor, on page six of your report, before we get too far from this issue, there was something I wanted to clear up. When the prosecutor asked you about physical abuse, your answer was debatable. What did you mean by that? Sir, if a child is injured and the parent does not take action, that is considered physical abuse. When Ethan fell in the diner and hit his head and the owner said, I need to call 911 and didn't, I consider that physical abuse. All right. So before you move on, let's be clear. Is that the only thing that you consider as physical abuse as it relates directly to this defendant? Additionally, when Ethan was with his parents and fell again and reported a loss of consciousness and was not taken to seek medical attention, I also consider that to be physical abuse. Thank you. If you may continue. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Honor. Um, on page six, doctor, in the last sentence of exposure to violent scenes, you make the statement, quote, this mentality is typical of persons who spend an inordinate amount of time ingesting violent content. Do you see that? Page six, what paragraph? It's the last sentence under exposure to violent scenes. Yes, sir. Doc, you don't cite anything for that, do you? There is no citation here. Okay. What do you base that on? I base it on my clinical experience, sir. Doctor, I mean, that's been studied, hasn't it? It has. And it's been largely debunked. Isn't that true? That is not true. Okay. Can you cite me anything? So Any literature that substantiates sure. that? I'm happy to respond. So it's hotly debated as to whether if one is exposed to frequent scenes of violence and carnage, if that exposure has an adverse effect on that child. Some experts say no, and some experts say yes. I can cite you Eric Erickson, developmental psychologist, who chronicles that between the ages of zero to five, a child learns most of his core values. In fact, children absorb what they observe. So, doctor, thank you for that answer. But the defendant's playing of video games actually post-dates this thinking, right? He reports having violent thoughts long before he played any of those video games. Isn't that true? That is true. Okay. So, you can't have cause and effect where the violent thoughts are caused by the video games he played later. Would you agree with me? Can you rephrase that question, please? He's having violent thoughts at age five or six, and he plays video games at age 13. You would agree with me the video games didn't cause the thoughts? Sure didn't make them better. Okay. So you're saying a person who already had violent thoughts was urged on by the video games he was watching? What I am saying is that at age six, if you're having aberrant thoughts and you engage yourself in frequent exposure to video games, it's not going to make you a better person. We can agree on that, Doctor. Thank you. All right, Doctor, on page seven, you talk about mental illness, correct? Yes, sir. And you cite, this, you cite the statutory definition of mental illness, and you also refresh, reference something you refer to as, quote, the Miller factor. Do you see that? Yes, sir. Doctor, what? Which Miller factor are you referring to? The Miller factor of 2012. 
or the Miller theorem of pre-cut pizza. So doctor, we walked through at the start of your testimony what the five Miller factors are from the United States Supreme Court. There are five of them. And what I'm asking you is when you say in the last line of the first paragraph under evidence of mental illness, you say taking into account, taking into consideration certain factors known as quote, the Miller factor. And what I'm saying is what, when you're talking about mental illness, which Miller factor are you talking about? The inability to extricate oneself from a dysfunctional family. All right, so you're saying the second is family and home life is where you would put mental illness. It's family and home life, yes sir. Doctor, you say that the defendant, and this is in the, the last full paragraph on page seven, that the defendant is without question someone who is mentally ill. You see that? Yes, sir. And you base that on the text messages that you cite in the pages following and some testing you did, correct? I base that on my clinical in the brief. I base that on my testing using objective testing methods. So I just want you to look at the sentence that follows that. It says, a review of his verbalization through text messages and psychological testing substantiate this assertion, right? Yes, sir. And then you referenced a group of roughly 200 text messages, correct? Yes, sir. Doctor, the statutory definition of mental illness in criminal law relates to the question of criminal responsibility. Are you familiar with that? Yes, sir. Have you testified previously about criminal responsibility? I have. All right. And that has to do with whether the defendant has a viable insanity defense, true? That is correct. Doctor, you reviewed Dr. Anaker's report, correct? I did. And would you agree with me that it's a very thorough report? I do not. Okay, what's missing? I looked at Dr. Anaker's report. And in all of my years of testing, and this is, of course, no disrespect, ma'am, sir. I'm just giving a factual response to your question. Not one testing was done in Dr. Annika's report. In Dr. Annika's report, Ethan expressed hearing voices and seeing things. In Dr. Annika's report, Ethan said that at age six, he went up to the, uh, to the preschool person, and this is what he said. Wouldn't it be cool if cars can just crash into this school and kill a lot of people? And the person said, then why would you say that? That is referenced in Dr. Annika's report, sir. Right, it is, exactly. Why, why is that a problem or something missing in her report? So to conclude, that such a person does not have mental illness is striking. All right, so doctor, other than um, the absence of testing, anything else that you, um, where you disagree that it's a thorough report? It is not, sir. Okay, outside of the testing, what else do you think is missing? So to diagnose someone with mental illness, there's three ways to do that. You look at the brain. Which you did not do, correct? I did not do. Correct. You test the brain. Correct. Which I did times 15. Okay. Then you use cluster of symptoms using the DSM. That is the Bible or the Quran for psychologists. There is no evidence that that was done. And then the fourth way, which most people do, is to guess. I did not see one, two, three. Okay, doctor, you both didn't test the brain, right? I'm sorry? Neither of you tested the brain. You've agreed with that. You didn't I give him an MRI. Neither of you did. Neither you nor Dr. Anaker tested the brain. No, that is not true. I'm sorry, image the brain. Thank you. I okay. did not. So number one, neither of you did number one. That is and, correct. And your testimony is you did number two. You gave him 15 tests, right? And you're saying Dr. Anaker did not. Mm -hmm. It right? was not evidenced in her report. Okay, and you're testifying that the third method is to look at the reported symptoms, correct? Yes, sir. And in fact, that's exactly what Dr. Anneker did. She included that. She just disagreed with your conclusion, right? She didn't deny he had symptoms. I don't think that's true, sir. 
And you just referenced her talking about this report to the person on the playground at the school, right? She, she included that, right? Well, the conclusion was that he's not mentally ill. That's right, doctor. And in fact, she cites all the text message and many more than you do that when he talks about, I have hallucinations, right? She includes that in her report. Would you agree with me? She did. Okay. So what I'm trying to get at, doctor, is I asked you if it's a very thorough report. You said no. You said she didn't do testing. And I'm asking you, what else do you think was not in her report that makes it not complete or thorough? Looking at cluster symptoms, looking at the DSM, and based on the guideline of the DSM, which is a diagnostic and statistical manual, if someone tells you as a psychologist, I am hearing voices. If someone tells you as a psychologist, I am seeing things. And if you look at their text messages, and in their text messages, it's replete with, I am seeing things. There's a demon in my house. Let me take a video. That is evidence of mental illness, sir. Mental illness is real. So, doctor, you have not answered my question. I'm not asking you if you disagree with Dr. Anarker because I know you do. What I'm asking you is she references all of that in her report, and she disagrees with your conclusion. And I'm saying what else is missing from her report? Could you just answer just that question, please? I don't know what else is missing from her report. Okay, so just the testing. I don't know what, what else is missing from her report, sir. All right. And in fact, her report cites extensively from the record. Would you agree? She cites a lot of text messages. Would you agree? Yes, sir. And extensively from the journal. Would you agree? Yes, sir. She talks about his internet searches. Would you agree? Yes, sir. The bird video. Yes, sir. The video of the school shooting. Yes, sir. Her own questions of the defendant and his responses regarding those things, correct? Yes, sir. All right. Other than your disagreement on the diagnosis, is there anything in Dr. Anaker's report that you believe is factually incorrect? So, sir, just to clarify, my response is not my disagreement with Dr. Anaker's report. I have never met Dr. Anaker. What I am saying is that I don't know what her conclusions are based on. I don't know. It's not on the DSM. It's not based on testing. I don't know what the conclusions are based Doctor, on. Doctor, I've asked you a straightforward question is, are any of her, anything in her report factually incorrect? It's a yes or no question whether you believe she had something that's factually incorrect. It's difficult for me to answer that question, sir. Well, you didn't highlight or note that she got something wrong, did you, in terms of the facts? And the reason why it's difficult for me to answer that, that question. Doctor, you can address that and redirect. I don't, I'm Thank not you. concerned with why it's difficult. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, Judge, just one moment, Your Honor. Yes. Doctor, I'd like to show you Dr. Anaker's report. You indicated you did review it, correct? I did, sir. May I approach you, Mr. Honor? Yes. And could you just reference which exhibit that would be in your Bible? Your Honor, this is not yet an exhibit, but I am going to read it to you in a minute. Doctor, uh, may I approach Your Honor? Yes. Doctor, I'm showing you what's been marked as People's Exhibit 64. you recognize that? I do, sir. Is that the report you review? Yes, sir. Your Honor, at this time I move to admit people's proposed 64. 
the objective. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me. Two questions <laughs> before you it. Can I make, provide the court with a copy? Yes, please. All right, doctor, I want to look at page 61 of Dr. Anaker's report. And I want to read you some statements from Dr. Anaker's report and ask you if you agree with them. close to the end, Doctor. It's 67 pages, I think, and it's page 61. Thank you. I'm there now. All right. So I'm looking at the first full paragraph on the page, and I'm going to go through a few of the statements there. If you look at the first sentence, Dr. Anaker indicates, when considering the question whether the defendant was experiencing a substantial disorder of thought, at the legally relevant time, there is no indication from objective sources that the defendant engaged in unusual behavior that would be typical of psychosis in and around the time of the alleged offenses. Do you see that? I see that, sir. Do you agree with that? I don't know what those objective sources are that she's referencing, sir. Well, that's what my question to you, Doc. She says there aren't any. And what I want to know is, do you have any objective sources that the defendant was experiencing or was showing unusual behavior that would be typical of psychosis in and around the time of the alleged offenses? Do you have any objective sources you would point to? I do. Please tell us, doctor. We all saw the video, sir. The video of the shooting? We saw the video of the shooting. All right. And you're saying he's exhibiting signs of psychosis during the video of the shooting. We saw the video that he made the night before. We listened to him saying, I am a demon. I'm glad you brought that up, doctor. Do you know what that's in reference to? I don't know. Do you know who the defendant's idol is? I don't know. You didn't ask him that? No, I, I don't know. He references it in the journal. Did you not read the journal? I read his journal. OK. And you know he idolizes another school shooter. Are you aware of that? I am aware of that. OK. And do you know that the reference to a demon is a direct reference to that other school shooter? So for someone to verbalize that tells me that person has a serious thought disorder. So if I say to you, doctor, you know, that other school shooter referenced demons and I really think he's great. You're going to say I have some evidence of psychosis because I reference that and I admire that person. I would say you have some serious issues. Okay. Any other objective evidence? I'm sorry, sir. Any other objective sources that you would rely on other than the two videos you just referenced? <clears throat> objective evidence will be testing which wasn't done. No, doctor. Objective sources means independent, not self-reporting. A lot of your testing is self-reporting. I'm talking about objective sources. Let's, I, let's help with this, doctor. Can yeah, you explain we, to the court the difference between objective sources and subjective sources? Sure. Objective sources are sources that are devoid of my opinion and, a, and that exists. Subjective sources are sources that where I can um, infuse my opinions and thoughts. That's my definition. But doctor, it's not just your opinion. It's also the defendant's opinion. You're looking for something that is not based on his opinion or yours that's objective. So you'd agree like the videos are objective. The video is the video, right? Yes, sir. Okay. But the defendant's statements your take on them, that's not objective. You agree with me? Okay. And what I'm asking you is, do you have any other objective sources 
that Mr. Crumbly engaged in an unusual behavior that would be typical of psychosis in around the time of the alleged event? I do not. Okay. All right, moving down that paragraph, doctor, it says, and this is Dr. Anaker's analysis, there is ample audio and video recordings of Mr. Crumbly both immediately before and immediately after the shooting. In none of the videos that this writer reviewed does he appear to be in the midst of a psychotic episode. In the videos immediately after the shooting, the defendant is observed communicating clearly with the police in a way that appears rational and relevant, suggesting reality-oriented thought processing. Are you aware of the video that she's referring to? I am not, sir. Okay, did you review videos of him shortly after the shooting? I did not see the videos of him outside of the school. So you did not see the videos of him in the um, in the sheriff's department vehicle? I did not, sir. And you did not see the videos of him sitting at the sheriff's department substation? I did not. Would you agree that those are objective sources that would allow you to get a look into what the defendant was, how he was behaving, and whether he was engaged in unusual behavior around the time of the shooting? I do agree, sir. And you did not see those, correct? I did not see those videos. She goes on to, to note, in that time frame, the defendant does not mention demons, paranoia, hallucinations, or delusions. He follows commands and answers all questions active, asked of him in a coherent manner. He does not appear to sound or behave in a disorganized manner. You don't have a basis to disagree with that. You didn't, you didn't watch those videos. I actually agree with that opinion, sir. Okay. He follows commands, answers all questions in a coherent manner. You agree? I, I do agree, sir. All right. Also, there's there's uh, documentation from the jail, which I think largely consists of Dr. Kadir's reports. Also, the, um, the reports that deputies do when they go by on watch and they make notations about the defendant. Did you see those reports? I did, sir. And the defendant was constantly monitored, correct? Yes, sir. Either continuously or every 15 minutes, right? Yes, sir. And so those observations are recorded by the, the officers that are watching him, right? Yes, sir. And would you agree with Dr. Anaker that there's no evidence that Mr. Crumbly exhibited thought process? I'm sorry, that, that the videos tend to show that he exhibited thought processes that were grossly organized, goal-directed, and linear with behavior that was appropriate. Jail staff did not observe him to be responding to internal stimuli. Would you agree with that? No, sir. Okay. Tell me why you disagree. The entire portion of this watch, five videos of of Ethan Crumley in psychosis. Okay, and I understand that's your testimony, doctor. That comes much later. Right now I'm talking about around the time of the shooting. Okay. And what I'm asking you is, when Dr. Anaker is talking around the time of the shooting, would you agree that the defendant exhibited thought processes that were grossly organized, goal-directed, and linear with behavior that was appropriate? Jail staff did not observe him to be responding to internal stimuli. I'm talking about in that time frame right around the shooting within a few days so i I'm, I'm i'm not i'm i do not understand the question i don't know if you're talking about why he was in the school at the sheriff's office or the open county jail i want to answer you but i want to understand what it is that you're asking of me sir right let's let's start from the where the shooting video starts until he leaves children's village yes right sir. During that time, would you agree that he's exhibiting thought processes that were grossly organized, goal-directed, and linear with behavior that was appropriate, and jail staff did not observe him to be responding to internal stimuli? Do you agree with that? Okay. Do you agree with that? Yes, sir. Okay. Can you briefly explain, Doctor, what does responding to internal stimuli mean? So an internal stimuli is responding to auditory hallucination. And what that means is that it happens in an episodic manner. So I could be experiencing internal stimuli right now, and then I can step away 
and I am not experiencing internal stimuli. It is, it is a very dynamic process. So, Doctor, I, I understand that you're saying that when someone responds to in, internal stimuli, that can come and go, right? Absolutely. They might one day be doing it or one moment, and then later they're not, correct? Yes, sir. And what I'm asking you is, what does that look like when they are responding to internal stimuli? What does that mean? So it varies from person to person. Some people may smile inappropriately, and some people may try to mask what they're hearing by pretending that they're not hearing. And then you have some folk who may actually respond to internal stimuli. Okay. So people react differently based on the source of that stimuli. All right. And you would agree what that boils down to for the lay person is someone is seeing or hearing things that aren't there, right? It's it's something that is internal to them and not in the world that all of us are observing. Yeah, it's their perception. So Doctor, I think you, you testified that you believe the defendant has a mental illness that constitutes a substantial disorder, correct? I did. And that you believe it significantly impaired his judgment, behavior, and capacity to recognize reality? I did. Okay. And, Doctor, is it your testimony that this defendant is not criminally responsible? My testimony is that Ethan Crumley is mentally I understand that. And now I'm asking the next question, which is that your testimony that he's not criminally responsible. Mayor, I'm going to object. Um, that is not what we are here to argue today. We are not arguing criminal responsibility. The defendant has pled and we withdrew our insanity defense notice. May I respond, Your Honor? Yes. I think it's very important whether this doctor thinks that he is not criminally responsible. If that's his opinion, I think the court can take that into consideration. If you object to the rule, I would also be moved to move to. <clears throat> so Ethan Crumley has pled guilty to the crimes, the facts are the facts, and they cannot be taken back, sir. Doctor, that's not my question to you. My question is, do you understand the legal concept of criminal responsibility, and you your, yourself have prepared reports regarding criminal responsibility in other cases, correct? That is correct. So you understand the legal standard? Yes, sir. You know the first step is mental illness that's a substantial disorder that significantly impairs the defendant's judgment, behavior, capacity to recognize reality, right? Yes, sir. And you've already testified, in your opinion, he meets that criteria, right? Yes, sir. And now I'm asking you the second step. Do you believe that he's criminally insane? I believe he's mentally ill, and his mental illness played a factor into the uh, events of the shooting. So, doctor, it's a, it's a yes or no question. Do you believe he's criminally insane, or do you not believe? He's already pled guilty, sir. Please answer the question directly, Dante, if you can. Please re-ask your question. Is it your opinion that this defendant meets the legal definition of criminal insanity? Is that your opinion? I don't think so, sir. Okay. And why is that? Can you rephrase that, that question, please? Why is it that you believe he suffers from a statutorily defined mental illness, but you do not believe that he's criminally insane? So I believe he not I believe he has a diagnosable mental illness, and he engaged in a horrific um, act, which took the lives of several students, and he's pled guilty. Um, and my understanding is that he was found to not be criminally insane, and I will go with that opinion, sir. Okay, and you know from your own work what the second step is after mental illness, right? What is the second step? What is it that this defendant does not have that makes him not criminally responsible, <laughs> that makes him not insane? So it's a very high standard one has to prove, one has to prove that a mental illness was directly related to the act that followed. Right, and so doctor, the legal term is that the defendant, in fact, appreciates the nature and quality of the wrongfulness of his conduct. That's the standard, correct? Correct. And in fact, to the lay person, it means the defendant knew right from wrong, right? That is correct. All right. So, Doctor, one of the things you rely on uh, to substantiate the mental illness and, and this psychosis you talk about are the text messages that you include in your report, correct? 
that. Yes, sir. And you say that your the, the statement that he's without question someone who's mentally ill is substantiated by those text messages. And I want you to turn to the pages of your report that include those. That's pages eight through I think twenty one. Just reference which report the June report. The June report. Thank you, Your Honor. And I'll, I'll I'm going to try to stick to the June report now. Thank you. What page, sir? So you, the text messages, I think, start at the bottom of page 7 of your report. Okay. And they're 14 pages, and I think you've agreed with me, ballpark about 200 text messages, correct? Yes, sir. How many text messages did you actually review? I don't have an exact number, and if I can't give you an answer to that, what I do know, I reviewed, and again, I don't want to give uh, an incorrect answer, but I'm thinking I saw 20,000 text messages. Okay. So how did you decide out of all the text messages, which ones to include in your report? I decided based on the fact of just logic and process of elimination because it's not appropriate, I didn't feel, for me to include 20,000 text messages in a report. It wouldn't serve anyone any good. So I looked for themes. What are the themes in the, in the uh, text messages? And I included those that I felt were in that theme of mental illness. So, so Doctor, that's actually very remarkable to me. Um, you reviewed 200 you pulled 200 text messages out of roughly 20,000, right? That is correct, sir. Okay. And you said you chose themes that sort of brought out what you were trying to illustrate and that supported your opinion that the defendant suffers from mental illness, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. And doctor, all of the texts you cite are from one date, April 5th of 2021. You want to take a look at your report? Certainly. <clears throat> that is correct, sir. So you cite about 1% of all the text messages and all from the same date, and you indicate that 1% one day substantiates mental illness, correct? That's your the basis of your opinion. So the basis of, no, that is not correct, sir. Okay. How come you didn't cite any other text messages, doctor? A number of the text messages were not germane to the uh, report. They were just innocuous. I can give you examples if you want. Let's turn this around, doctor. You agree with me. You cited only from one day, correct, in your yes, report? Sir. Okay. And what you're telling me is the only germane text you found were from one day. That is correct. And it's like, I got to do the math, seven months before the shooting, correct? That is correct. And so everything you saw, you say that one day, that's the one I'm going to hang my hat on. That's the one that tells me that he suffered from a mental illness when he committed the shooting, right? That is not correct. Okay. Explain that to me. My opinion and my conclusions are based on my testing. All right. Thank you, doctor. So... Doctor, um, someplace in your report, I think it's after the text messages, you referenced the time of those texts. Do you recall that? I'll find the page. It's, uh, it's page 22, and it's the third bullet point at the top. That is correct. And you say most messages were sent around 4 a.m., correct? Yes, sir. And that was remarkable to you and significant, correct? That is correct. Okay. Doctor, are you familiar with something called UTC? Can you spell it out for me, sir? It's U, the letters U, T, and C. It stands for Coordinated Universal Time. I know the letters are out of order, but it stands for Coordinated Universal Time. Are you familiar with that? I don't know if I am, sir. All right. So, doctor, you based your assumption that these messages were sent 
around 4 a.m. based on the little time indicators for each message, right? They each say 4, 5, 20, 21. They start at 3.50 a.m. and they go until 4.41 a.m. You see that? Okay, I agree, sir. And doctor, in fact, those every one of them says afterwards UTC plus zero, right? Okay. And you agree with that we're on Eastern time, right? That is true. And are you aware that Eastern time is UTC minus four? Okay. Are you aware of that? Okay, sir. Yes. So those messages were in fact sent between 11.50 a.m. and 12.41 I'm sorry, 11.50 p.m. and 12.41 a.m. Are you aware of that? I am that, but I, I agree. So your assumption that they were sent around 4 a.m. is it just, that's an assumption you made and it's just, just not true. Okay. Doctor, um, you, you testified that you have seen the defendant recently, or at least during your testing, and that you agree he is competent to stand trial. I did. Okay. Um, doctor, you were played the, the jail camera video, right? That you've discussed where, where the defendant is showing signs of, of distress and upset. And I think you say psychosis, right? Yes, sir. Doctor, the prosecution brought that to your attention, to the defense attention, right? We're the ones who said this is concerning behavior, right? That is correct. All right. And you then reviewed that, didn't you? Correct. And you consulted with counsel and you were asked your opinion, right? That is correct. About whether this person was psychotic or competent and able to proceed with this hearing, right? That is correct. And you said he is, right? Yes, sir. You also would agree with me that that behavior comes after the defendant had been in the jail in a one person cell for 16 months? That is correct. And you would agree with me that the defendant was not behaving that way right before, during, or after the shooting. You'd agree with me? Okay. Would you agree with that? I don't have evidence otherwise, so yes. Okay. Um, he wasn't behaving that way when you interviewed him, right? He was not. He hasn't been behaving that way during this hearing, right? That is correct. And so this is the only incident you're aware of where the defendant exhibited that kind of behavior. Can you rephrase that question, please, sir? This is the only incident you're aware of where the defendant has exhibited that kind of behavior. Are you referencing those five videos? I'm referencing, yes. Are you aware those are all from the same incident, all from one date? I'm not sure. Okay, I, I'm gonna tell you that they are, but what I'm asking is outside of those five videos, are you aware of any other instance where the defendant was behaving like that or showing those symptoms? Actually, I am. Okay. There are serious concerns about suicidal ideation, which is why he was on suicidal watch. So, doctor, those are instances where he had something in his cell, might be trying to tie it to a speaker. He said he wasn't suicidal, but they were concerned, right? That is correct. There were a few times when they thought he needed to be observed constantly because he showed concerns about suicide, right? That is correct. That's not the same as psychosis, is it? Actually, for one to try to harm themselves is an expression of mental illness. I asked you about psychosis. Psychosis means a break from reality. Right. And someone thinking about killing themselves is not broken from reality, are they? Yes, sir. All right. So you're saying thoughts of suicide are a symptom of psychosis. That's your opinion. That's the testimony you're offering to the court today. I am. So Doctor, in the in the video, um, you expressed the defendant saying something about God or why didn't you stop it, right? Yes, sir. And in your opinion, what do you think he's referring to? He's saying, God, why didn't you stop it? Why didn't you save her? Right, and what do you think he's, he's referring to? God, 
why did you allow the shooting to take place even though he did the shooting? Thank you. That's okay. the break from reality. Yes. So, so Doc, do you agree with me? It's your opinion. He's talking about the shooting, and he's saying, why did you let the shooting happen, right? Yes. Dear sir. God. And so you agree with me. That upset was not something that predated the shooting. That's a result of the defendant's own actions. You agree with me? Absolutely. Thank you. Doctor, you um, say on page 25 into page 26 of your report, again, the June report, that the defendant reports extreme sorrow. The very last few words of page 25 into page 26. You see that? Yes, sir. What do you mean by that? I have here that, and if I may read this to you, sir. Please. I hope we're talking about the same thing. He reports nightmares, depression, and extreme sorrow over the outcome of his actions. Right, and so what I'm asking you, that's the sentence I'm talking about, is when you say extreme sorrow, what do you mean? Ethan is slowly coming to grips with what he did and the horror that transpired after school, and he's expressing extreme sorrow. All right, so doctor, though, that's not what you say at the end of that sentence, is it? You say that he's expressing extreme sorrow over the outcome of his actions. Correct. Right? But you don't know what, what outcome is. Outcome singular, right? And you don't know what outcome that is. So is he extremely sorry that he's in jail? Sir, Ethan took the life of four innocent people. And that is not okay. We agree on that, doctor. What I'm saying is you don't include in, in your report that he expressed extreme sorrow for taking the lives of four students and shooting seven other people and terrorizing a school. You don't say that. You say he sorrow, he experiences that over the outcome of his actions. And what I'm saying is, okay, could be that he killed four people. It also could be that he's in jail, right? That is a possibility. It could be that his parents are in jail, right? I don't know that to be a fact, but okay. But he could be, right? It's possible. Okay. And he could be experiencing sorrow that he's going to spend the rest of his life in prison. So we're speculating, but okay. All right. And what I'm saying is, as you sit here today, you can't tell us which one it is. You don't note it in your report. You just note he was experiencing extreme sorrow over the outcome of his actions. That's what I have in my report. Sir. Did you observe the defendant's demeanor during the testimony in this hearing? I did not, sir. You did not? No, sir. When the video of the shooting was shown? I did not. When the two students were testifying? I did not. Do you think that's important? Do I think what's important? Whether the defendant feels anything when he hears that testimony or sees that video. I think it's important. Doctor, I want to talk to you a little bit about remorse. I think you, you say that the defendant is, is sorrowful that he's experienced some remorse. Do you agree with that? I do. Doctor, when did the defendant torture baby birds? I don't have the, the date in front of me, but there's there's the videos that, uh, that he made. Do you know roughly when that was? I know it was before May. It was right, okay. before I interviewed him, but I, you know, I didn't memorize the date. Wait, uh, May of 2023 or May of 2021? Sir, I do not know the date, and I do not want to give an incorrect answer. You you watched the bird video, right? I did. And you're aware of his torturing baby birds, but you don't know about the time frame for that. That is correct, sir. Just one second. On page 26 into page 27, you mentioned several times the stressful experience. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. 
on page 26. All right, so page 26 into page 27. You mentioned several times, quote, the stressful event. Do you see that? Yes, sir. And then you conclude that the defendant probably has PTSD, correct? Yes, sir. What is the stressful experience you're referring to in your report? All right, doctor, I'm sorry, we're looking at page 26 and the page 27 of your report and you refer to the stressful experience. You refer to it mm, four, one, two, three, four times. You see that? Yes. What is the stressful experience you're referring to in your report? So those are actually questions on the PTSD questionnaire that, that he endorsed. Okay. And what I'm asking you is, you refer to it multiple times and I'm asking you, what is the stressful experience? Of dealing with the consequences of his actions. Okay. Dealing with depression, dealing with nightmares, dealing with his current circumstance. So that's a result of the shooting he committed, not a cause of the shooting he committed. Would you agree with me? Yes, sir. All right. So his, his PTSD, his post-traumatic post stress is from the shooting that he committed. Yes, sir. Judge, I have quite a few more questions that I did not realize time is. We will really take a natural break. Please continue. All right, uh, doctor, you indicated uh, at the bottom of page 27 that the defendant, quote, feels guilty all the time. You see that? I'm getting there, sir. Page 27. What part of the page you're looking at? It is almost the last, it's the second to last sentence on the page. Yes. Notable responses to this inventory were the following, I feel guilty all the time, right? That is correct. And you don't indicate what he feels guilty for, right? He actually, I, this is in reference to the Beck depression questionnaire. There's a series of questions in there. Okay. So the prompt was, do you feel guilty at all sometimes? And so he, he endorsed that. All right. He feels guilty all of the time. All right. So that's just a questionnaire, and it doesn't say, what do you feel guilty about? It says, do you feel guilty all the time? Correct. Okay. Judge, I, I do have another series of questions. I think this is, for me, a natural break, if the court is, is all right with that. We can go ahead and take a break. We'll go ahead and break for lunch, but I'm not going to take an extended break yet. We're going to finish this hearing today. And so, with that being said, we will return at 1 o'clock, and we will continue with the cross-examination of that day. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Deputy Attorney, take the floor. Please be seated in the courtroom until the defendant has exited. Thank you. I'll see you all at 1 p.m. The court stands at recess, so you may step down. All rise.
we have to lock the courtroom until the judge is ordered. And we'll just stay in the door. You can grab whatever you need. And then
Thank you. Good afternoon, Graham. All me be seated. Thank you kindly. Thank you. Your Honor, calling People versus Ethan Crumley, case number 279506FC. Thank you, Pierce, for the record. Chairman Tom, for the people. Thank you, Mark. Peace on behalf of people. Good afternoon, Your Honor. David Williams on behalf of People. Call up Michelle Lawson on behalf of Ethan Crumbly. Jamie Hopp on behalf of Ethan Crumbly. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Jeffrey H. McCulley on behalf of Ethan Crumbly. Thank you. You all may be seated, but before you have a seat, Council, please approach.
community. But I'm just saying, I know. Yeah, I can be careful with that because I can see it. So I'm just waiting for that letter that I feel so Dr. King, sir, you may retake the stand. <laughs> sir, you may be seated. You are still under oath, sir. Uh, you're very welcome. Thank you, you may continue. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Honor. Doctor, I want to try to get as quickly as I can through um, the testing portion of your report. But what I need to do is to listen to my question, pretty much yes or no, try to answer just the question I'm asking. If there's something else you can address it on, redirect. All right? Thank you. Thank you, All sir. Right. So, doctor, you um, tested the defendant and you described symptomology, things he's experiencing at the time of the testing, correct? Yes, sir. Right. And we talked about PTSD and we talked about the fact you agree with me. That's a result of the shooting, not the cause of the shooting. Right. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Yes. Sir. OK. And so, doctor, you make a number of statements in your testing and I'll just review a, a few of those. Um, one of the things on page 35, you say that the defendant feels trapped and constantly persecuted with no means of escape. And that's a, one of the, the things that comes out of one of your tests, right? But that's at the time you tested him. Would you agree with me? Yes, sir. All right. And so you're not seeing he felt that leading up to the shooting. You're saying he feels that now. And that's not surprising given that he's in jail facing a long prison sentence. Would you agree? I don't. You don't agree with that? Okay. You don't expect that someone in jail for a long sentence would feel, quote, trapped and constantly persecuted with no means of escape. That's what he felt before also. Doctor, in your summary, you state that the defendant was, quote, on page 40, not believed by any responsible adults. Who are the responsible adults you're talking about? His parents. Okay, who else? His high school, his counselor. All right, that's important to me, doctor. Explain to me when his high school counselor, quote, did not believe him because, in fact, the defendant lied to the counselor and said he was not suffering this distress, correct? That's correct. All right. So it's not that the counselor didn't believe him. It's the defendant didn't tell him. He told him in his drawing. His <laughs> okay. But, doctor, it's not that he didn't believe him. It's that when he asked him about the drawings, the defendant lied. Absolutely. Yes, sir. What other adults, what other responsible adults didn't believe the defendant? I'm not talking to people about people he lied to who didn't pick up on it. I'm talking about people that he expressed his need for help to and who did not believe him, other than his parents. So those were his notable ones, his parents and his high school counselor. You disagree with me, doctor. He didn't tell the high school counselor he wanted help. He said the opposite. Is that a yes, doctor? Yes, sir. Doctor, you describe the defendant as a broken person with a broken brain, and I don't need to describe that. I need to know what clinically, what does that mean? What's the medical definition of a broken person with a broken brain? Mental illness is a symptom of a broken brain. Is broken brain a medical term, doctor? It is a layman's term. I can I'll be more than happy to go into a clinical definition of a broken brain. Is there but a clinical definition? Like if I look it up, am I going to find that? What you want to see is brain dis-ease, brain dysfunction, cingulate gyrus dysfunction, uh, limbic system dysfunction. All of those are clinical terms, and I thought we wanted to be brief, so that's why I said a broken brain. All right, and you'd agree with me that a broken brain is not a Miller factor, right? It's not a Miller factor. And you agree that you're not offering a fix for the broken brain, are you? I'm sorry, sir? You're not offering a fix for a broken brain. 
No, sir. Okay. And you're not telling the court even that it can be fixed, are you? Yes, I am, actually. Okay. You, you know that this can be fixed? Yes, sir. All right. Doctor, you finished that sentence on page 40, describing the, the defendant as a person waiting for something terrible. That's in the third to last sentence in the last full paragraph on page 40. to the last sentence in the last full paragraph so it's the paragraph under summary of defendant's mental illness and you say broken person with a broken brain waiting for something terrible to happen do you see that yes sir doctor he wasn't waiting was he he was he was planning wasn't he planning something terrible he was right. and he planned it out and he wrote about it and he recorded himself talking about it and he actually anticipated people finding his recordings right? Yes, sir. And then he carried out something terrible, right? Yes, sir. You make another remarkable statement on the last line in the last full paragraph of page 40, quote, the defendant's form of mental illness, if not treated, typically ends with deadly consequences. Do you see that? Yes, sir. You don't cite anything to support that in your report, do you? It's not cited in my report, sir. That is correct. Okay. What do you base that on? The idea that the defendant's form of mental illness, as you describe it, typically ends with deadly consequences. Yes, sir. Can you cite the court what you rely on for that prospect? Every day in this country, this is, I'm citing it, I'm giving you the, the evidence, sir. 22 veterans kill themselves. Doctor, that's not the question. You use the word typically, and you use the mental illness describing this defendant. And what I'm asking is, where do you get that? That it typically ends in deadly consequences. Untreated mental illness, sir, without intervention, does not end very well. But you say it typically ends with deadly consequences. Yes, sir. You got anything you can cite that says that? 22 veterans every day in this country. The disorders that you list that you diagnose the defendant with, those aren't specifically associated with youth, are they? Can you rephrase that question, please? The disorders that you diagnose the defendant with on page 41, those are not specifically associated with youth, are they? That's not true. Okay, tell me. Depression? You're saying is associated with youth. Adults don't have depression? Yes, sir. And so do adolescents. I, I understand, doctor. What I'm saying is specifically associated with youth. That, that this is a problem that youth face that adults do not. And you would agree with me that adults suffer from major depressive disorder or even severe with psychotic features, as you describe it, generalized anxiety disorder, and obsessive compulsive disorder, right? Yes, sir. Those are not exclusive to youth. Oh, correct. Lots of adults have those same diagnoses. Absolutely. And lots of those people with those disorders don't kill anyone, do they? That is correct. Lots of people suffer depression. Yes? Yes, sir. Even severe depression. Yes, sir. And those people don't all become mass shooters, do they? That is true. Doctor, you spend quite a bit of time talking about implicit bias. And I want to start our discussion about that um, and say, you and I agree that implicit bias exists. And it's been widely studied and well documented. And I know you teach seminars on it. And I agree with you that it's an important issue. What I don't understand is how implicit bias has anything to do with this case. So that's what I want to focus on, okay? What was the genesis of this idea of yours to view this shooter and this shooting through the lens of race? So what I do when I teach implicit bias classes, sir, I... So, so doctor, I want to stop you. My specific question is, what was the genesis of this idea that you have to view this shooter and this shooting through the lens of race? I was about to explain it. Let me ask you this. Was that a, your idea or someone else's? It's actually based on my profession, on my professional experience, sir. All right, so this was your idea? It's not solely my idea, sir. No, what I mean is, <clears throat> when you decided to put that in your report, no one said to you, hey, doctor, how about implicit bias? You came to them and said, you know what? I can explain this. It's implicit bias. True? It's your idea. No, sir. Who involved in this case said to you, how about implicit bias? I got my information by looking at the data and by disaggregating the data. Sir. I'm not talking about the data that you rely on. I'm talking about the idea. 
Have you ever seen another mitigation report that blames a defendant's conduct on implicit bias? I have not. Okay. And what I'm saying is, so you, you have this idea, right? Okay. And where did that come from? From my professional training and my research and teaching on implicit bias. So, Doctor, on page 44, you refer to implicit bias as, quote, the, perhaps the most telling variable that contributed to the tragic events that can be traced. Pardon me. The most telling variable that contributed to the tragic events can be traced to implicit bias. Do you see that? I don't see, but I do agree. It's under, it's the first sentence on page 44 under implicit bias and failure to act. Just one moment. What do you mean by the most telling variable? Let me, you know what, let's make this faster. What are the other variables that are not as telling? Explicit bias. It did not seem to be a factor. That is one variable that did not seem to be a Hold on, doctor. I'm talking about variables in this case. You're talking about the most telling variable in this case. You say that contributed to the tragic events. You're talking about the shooting in this case, correct? Yes, sir. I want to know the variables you're talking about in this case for which implicit bias is the most telling. What are the other variables related to this case? I don't have fathers. It's the only variable? That's what I know. That's the right. So you don't look at parental neglect or his home life as one of the most telling variables? No all contributing factors. Or the untreated mental illness, or you claim untreated mental illness that according to you typically ends with the defendant killing someone? That's not the most telling variable to you? They're all contributing factors. All right. You say multiple times in your report that the defendant needed and was asking for help and he didn't get it, right? That's according to you. Yes, sir. And the people you say that he didn't come get it from were his parents and then you, you told me the school, right? Yes, sir. Does implicit bias have anything to do with his, pal his parents' failure to get him help? I'm sorry? Does implicit bias have anything to do with his parents' failure to get him help? I don't think so. Okay. So you're just talking about the school? Yes, sir. All right. And doctor, when you're talking about the school, one of the things you rely on are the homework papers where the defendant drew guns and notes all over them, right? Correct? That's one reason. Yes, okay. Sir. And you pasted those assignments into your report, right? Yes, sir. And you referenced those in several places in your report. And I want to go over three of those with you very briefly. On page two of your report, You say the defendant had been turning in assignments Doctor, let's skip to page three. Under your sources of information, you list assignments turned into the Oxford High School leading up to the events. Do you see that? The fourth bullet point up. Yes, I do. All right, you say on page two, leading up to the offense, the defendant had been turning in school. This is uh, the bottom paragraph on that page, about a little more than halfway through, it says, the defendant had been turning in school assignments with weapons drawn on them and sad faces and saying things like the world is a joke, school is a joke, I'm a joke, or falling for a fool's joke. Do you see that? Yes, sir. And in fact, you attach that specific assignment and it's at page 63 of your report. You want to take my word for it or you can, you can look. But page, I take your word for it. All right. Page 63 says the world is a joke, school is a joke, I'm a joke. That's what you're referring to, right? As one of the assignments, yes, sir. Yeah, and then on page 48, you say, despite turning in assignments with weapons drawn on every assignment, he was not suspended nor expelled from school because implicit bias says he did not fit the profile of a troubled student. You see that on page 48? Yes, sir. And then you attach all those assignments that you're relying on, right? Yes, sir. And your point is no one paid attention to those drawings because the defendant is white, right? 
My that's implicit is, bias, right? It's not subject to the same level of rigor. And you're relying on the homework assignments because you say if someone else had turned those in, they would have paid attention. But because the defendant is white, they overlooked that. That's your yes. opinion. Basically, okay. Peter. Yes, sir. Doctor, when and where were those homework papers found? Do you know? I believe they were found in his in his backpack. Okay. And, um, okay, was... that's that's what I needed to know after the shooting, right? That is correct. All right, and you notice there are no grades or anyone else's handwriting on any of those, are there? That is correct. And Doctor, those assignments. Do you have any evidence that anyone other than the defendant saw those until after the shooting? I do not. Okay, and so when you repeatedly say in your report that those assignments were tur turned in, you assumed that, right? That's correct. And you accused the teachers at Oxford High School of being racist. It's implicit bias, not overt, but it's racism, right? No, sir. You're saying that implicit bias is not a form of racism? Implicit bias is not racism, sir. Okay. They're two very different terms. Okay, and so what you're saying is because the student was white and not black, not racism, but implicit bias. They didn't pay attention to those assignments, right? That's what you put in your report. Everyone in this courtroom has some form of implicit bias, so it has nothing to do with race. I'm not debating that with you, doctor. What I'm saying is you're accusing those teachers of not paying attention to those homework papers because the defendant was white. That's your testimony. That is correct. Right. And doctor, none of those folks saw those homework papers. So if you accuse teachers at Oxford High School of not paying attention to the defendant, because of his race when they never saw those things. Does that matter to you? Sir, he turned in. Does it matter to you, doctor? It does matter. Okay. It do you want to amend your, your statement now I about Oxford High School based on the homework papers? I now that not. you know they didn't see him, you're going to stick with that? Yes, sir. Doctor, to be clear, you're stating that implicit bias is relevant to this case right, which is about a white student at a mostly white school who killed four other white students, shot a white teacher, shot six other white students. You're saying that implicit bias plays a role in this case, right? I do not understand your question, sir. You understand the things I just said. Who was involved in this case? A white student, four white students who were killed, a white teacher, six other white students who were shot. You agree that those are the actors in this case who were involved in the charges here? Those are the actors. Okay. Yes, sir. And you're saying implicit bias has a role in this case? In regards to the teacher's response. Okay. And what Miller factor does implicit bias relate to? There is no Miller factor, sir. Okay. And you would, would agree with me the Miller factors are things that mitigate a defendant's responsibility, right? Mm -hmm. Things like if you had fewer chances in life or a tough upbringing, those are mitigating, right? That is correct. Is growing up white in a mostly white school district a disability the defendant had to overcome? Can you rephrase the question, sir? Is growing up white in a mostly white school district a disability this defendant had to overcome? I don't think so. Okay. Did race make his circumstances more difficult? <laughs> I don't think so. Was he discriminated against? There's no evidence to show that. So, doctor, would you agree with me that growing up white is not a mitigating factor in this case? That is true. Doctor, you testified that you reviewed the bird video, video and the manifesto video and the school surveillance video before you submitted your first report, correct? I think so. All right. And doctor, I'll tell you and you can tell me if you disagree, but you don't mention those other than putting them in your sources in your first report. You don't mention them at all. Again, in the rest of your first report. Would you agree with that? That sounds about correct. All right. In your June report on page 49, you spend about two pages describing what happened leading up to and on the day of the shooting, correct? Do you want to look at page 49? I think the word please, sir. All right. Your report's a total of 69 pages long, right? That is correct. And you spend five sentences on the journal. You disagree with that? I think the word please, sir. Two sentences on the bird video. I think the word please. Four sentences on what you refer to as the manifesto video, right? I think they work for it. And then you spend about a page that you label, quote, the day of the shooting. You want to look at that or will you agree with me? I think they work for it, right. But, Doc, you really don't even spend a page describing the defendant's actions on the day of the shooting, do you? 
You never mention the defendant getting up early to get the gun and ammunition, do you? It's not mentioned in my report. You don't mention him packing it into his backpack? It's not mentioned in my report. Or getting himself to school? It's not mentioned in my report. Or getting into the school with the gun and the clips and the ammunition? It's not mentioned in my report. Or going into the bathroom? It's not mentioned in my report. Or putting toilet paper in his ears? It's not mentioned in my report. Did you ask him about that, doctor? Why he put toilet paper in his ear? I did not. And you don't defend... You don't mention the defendant shooting Phoebe, right? I did not. Or shooting Hannah, right? I did not. Or shooting, pardon me, Hannah or Madison. You don't mention that? I did not. Or Tate? I did not. Or Justin, that. right? I did not. Or Aiden or Molly Darnell or John or Riley or Elijah or Kylie. You don't mention any of that, do you? I didn't think it was appropriate, sir. Okay. That information was included, so you knew about it, you just didn't include it, right? I did not mention any names in my report, sir. Doctor, it's not just that you didn't mention any names. You don't talk about the defendant killing anyone, do you? I do. It's on page one, the first paragraph. You know, doctor, it's interesting you bring that up because you didn't say that. You changed your report to say allegedly the defendant did it. There is nothing in your report that suggests this defendant is responsible for the deaths of those kids. We'll get there. But you agree that was included in the materials you reviewed. You, you knew that information. I do. Doctor, you never talk about how many victims there were, do you? I did that. Isn't that relevant? It is relevant. Okay, but you don't talk about it. how many people he shot, how many people he killed, and how many he terrorized. You don't talk about that. That is correct. Doctor, you don't indicate how long the defendant spent walking through the school shooting people, do you? I do not. Do you know how long that was? I do not, sir. You think that matters? Perhaps it does. And you don't indicate the defendant's demeanor during the shooting, do you? I did not. And you saw the video, right? I did. Does not include audio, though, does it? I'm sorry? That video does not include audio, does it? Which video, sir? Of the shooting. I do not understand the question. Does not include audio? Correct. When you see the video of the shooting, there's no audio to that, right? I don't think so. Okay. Did you ask anyone what it sounded like inside the school during the shooting? I did not. Did you listen to the body cam audio and video of a staff member trying to save Hana? I did not listen to any audio, sir. Okay. Does any of that matter to you? It does matter. Okay. In your report, you don't even include one sentence about how this defendant killed the victims, do you? It's not included in my report, sir. All right. How far away was the defendant when he shot each of the victims who died? Sir, I watched the video. And he was pretty close to them. Pretty close. What do you mean by that? Point blank range? Yeah, I don't know the exact measurement, so I can't testify. To it's that. essentially the gun to the head in most cases. You agree with that? Those are the facts of the case. Do you know where on the body he shot the various victims? I do not. In the head, the neck, the chest? You're not aware? I believe one victim was shot in the head, at least one. Doctor, are you aware of when and how the defendant shot Justin Schilling? I am not aware, sir. Okay. He's in a bathroom. He's in a bathroom. Do you know how long he was in the bathroom with Justin and Keegan before he shot Justin? No, sir. Do you know how we asked Justin to get down on the ground and then he executed him? Are you aware of that? I take your word for it, sir. Okay. Does that matter to you? It does matter. Doesn't it speak to the defendant and his state of mind at the time? It does. You think that's the product of a juvenile brain? I do. <laughs> okay. Did you ask the defendant about that? I certainly asked him about the shooting. Did you ask him about his motivation or what he was thinking when he did it? I did, sir. But you don't include that in your report, do you? I did not. Doctor... Would you agree that being calm and methodical when you kill people is not a reflection of youth and impulsivity, is it? 
In which case, you have a question, sir? No, but I can repeat it. Okay. Being, being calm and methodical when you kill people is not a reflection of youth and impulsivity, is it? I think it's a reflection of what happened. Okay, but it's not, it's not youth. Adults do that, right? Absolutely. All right, doctor, I want to move to page 67 of your report. When the defendant was sitting in the office with the backpack next to him, you say, the defendant started to feel a sense of relief knowing that the sheriffs would descend on the school. You wrote that, right? Yes, I did. Yes, sir. And you characterized the defendant, we've talked about this, as someone who kept asking for help but never got it, right? That is correct. You cite times when he said to his friend B, I keep telling my parents I need help and they won't help me, right? That is correct. Doctor, that exact moment you're citing, when the defendant has the backpack next to him in the counselor's office, the defendant had the perfect opportunity to get help, didn't he? Absolutely. All right. And he didn't take that, right? He That's didn't take correct. that opportunity. Those are the facts of the case. Right. He'd asked for help many times, but when help is right there in front of him, he doesn't ask for help, does he? That is correct. And you'd agree if he just said, Mom and Dad, I need help. Or, I feel like there's no hope. I even brought a gun to school. They'd have given him help, wouldn't they? I've never met his parents. I don't know how they would have reacted. Well, the school. You don't have any reason to believe if he had said that, that he would not have gotten help, do you? I don't know, sir. I don't know the answer to that question. And it's not that no one believed him, right? He just didn't say it. You agree with me? I do not agree with that, sir. He never said it, did he? He never said it in the counselor's office. Did he tell you that he said, I really need help, Mr. Hopkins? I really need help, Mom and Dad? Did he tell you he said that? He wrote on his paper. <laughs> Doctor, we, help. we've talked about that. He then tells them that the paper was part of a video game. He says, I'm not asking for help. That's what he says to them, right? For the sake of brevity, sir, I will say yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so at that moment, Doctor, the defendant, for whatever reason, decided he wasn't going to ask for help, right? But, but, do you agree with me? At that moment, the counselor told his parents, you have to get him help within 48 hours, right? You agree with that? I read that. So at most, if the defendant's just not comfortable talking about it there, he's 48 hours away at most from the help that he's allegedly been begging for, right? So he should have gotten the help right away. Okay, okay, doctor, but I'm talking about the defendant now, not the other folks in the room. The defendant now knows after he's been asking for help for a long time. You cite April of 21, right? Yes, sir. He's less than two days away now, right? You agree with me? I agree with you. All right. And he doesn't choose to just say nothing and go home. He leaves that meeting and he goes to the bathroom and he takes the gun and he starts shooting, right? Actually, no, sir. He went back to classes. Okay, he went back to class, and instead of finishing out his classes for the day and going home and then getting help, he he decided to start shooting. No, sir. He went to the lunchroom and had his lunch. <laughs> and then he started shooting. He had time to think about it. Yes, sir. All right. Did you ask the defendant about that? I did, but he did not respond. On page 68, you, on, you said, did you ask the defendant about that? He just clarified it about that and what that means. Yes. So, doctor, did you confront the defendant with the fact that help was now, he was on the precipice of help, less than two days away. Why did he start shooting instead? Did you ask him that? I did not ask him that question. Okay. Sir. So he didn't explain that to you? That is correct. On page 68, you describe the defendant. I gotta look at the page. This is Doctor, on page 68 of your report, 
first paragraph, conclusion events, you say the defendant now returns to class with this feeling of terror and absolute astonishment. Those are your words, right? Yes, sir. And you're talking about the defendant. You're saying the defendant is the one who's feeling terror. Yes, sir. And then, doctor, even more remarkably, the sentence before that, you say, perhaps the saddest part of this very horrible saga is that the defendant was given his backpack with the gun and told to return to class. You've heard the testimony, doctor. You've read the reports. You've heard people crying in the courtroom. You've seen the families. And you're saying that the saddest part of this is that he was sent back to class. That's what's sad about this case. Those lives have been saved. That's true, doctor. And who made that decision? A number of people. All right. Finally, doctor, at the, on the very last page, you include one sentence that talks about the defendant murdering anyone. It just sort of hints at it. And in fact, in that sentence, you don't blame the defendant, do you? Where are you referring to, sir? I'm talking about the one sentence where you ever talk about the defendant killing anyone. The only one in your entire report. Could you just specify where this is? Yeah, it's the last sentence under conclusion events. Can you pause the page? 68. One moment, please. On page 68, the last sentence? Of the conclusion events. Oh. Can you read that to the court? It says, his obsessive thoughts and compulsion propelled him to take the lives of innocent people. Doctor, is that really your opinion about how these murders happen? Yes, sir. When you talk about obsessive thoughts, obsessed with what? What is the defendant obsessed with? With harming people. That propels him to do it. He's obsessed with torturing birds and killing people, right? That's correct. Oh. Doctor, would you agree with me? You spend very little time discussing the journal in your report. I spend time discussing it, sir. I don't right, know well, let's, it is, but okay. I spend time right. discussing it. Right. So you don't discuss it at all. You've already agreed with me in your first report, your January report, right? That is correct. All right. And then in your June report, you spend six sentences on it, right? I take your word for it, sir. All right. And you pull out two quotes, right? One about my parents would my parents would listen to me and help me or a therapist. I used to have a dream, and I realized working for hard won't working hard for your whole won't do anything. That's the first quote you use in events leading up to the shooting from the journal, right? I think it works, sir. And then he includes a second quote. We're on page forty nine. I have this huge crush on a girl in my sixth hour. I want to ask her out, right? Those That's are the that's correct. Those are the only two quotes you use from the journal, right? That's correct. All right. And you spend almost no time talking about the birds or the bird video. Again, in your in your initial report, you list it as a video and never mention birds anywhere again in your report. Would you agree? Have he made a video of himself torturing birds? Correct. Indicating his desire to make the birds feel Hold on. he was feeling. Oh, we're about to get there. That's two sentences in June, right? And in the first report, there's zero sentences. You agree? That is correct. All right. And you say, as you just said, the defendant probably saw this as a way of releasing the pain he was feeling inside, right? That is correct. You don't explain that, right? That's it. You don't offer any further explanation of why you think he probably saw this as a way of releasing the pain, right? That is correct. Did you ask the defendant about that? I did not. So, Doctor, there are things you asked him and things you didn't. Um, was the defendant forthcoming with you? Based on my testing, I believe he was. All right. You do indicate in one of your tests he was over-reporting, right? Yes, sir. That is correct. And, Doctor, you're aware of a discussion he had with a girl about being shot by his father with a BB gun? You're aware of that? I saw that in uh, one of the documentation. Okay. And 
he acknowledged he lied about that, right? Sometimes you just make stuff up. That is true. Did you ask him about why he killed baby birds and whether he liked it or not? I attempted to. Okay, and he didn't respond to that. He's still trying to come to grips with what, what has happened. Okay. Uh, and doctor, you really don't mention the manifesto video, right? You spend about four sentences on that and you don't, you don't quote anything from it, do you? Sir, I believe I've answered that question. I did mention it in my report. Doctor, hold on. I'm asking about a different video now. We're talking about okay. the manifesto video, right? And you don't address that in your first report, but in your second report on page 50, you label video the night before the night of the shooting. It says video before night of shooting, but it's video the night before the shooting, right? Okay. And you include a couple sentences about that. It's actually not mostly about the video. You say the night preceding the shooting, Ethan was locked out of his home by his parents following a verbal conflict surrounding his grades, right? There's six sentences in that section. Yes, and the, and the first one is you talk about he'd been in a verbal dispute with his parents and his parents actually locked him out of the house, right? That is correct. In fact, he'd been locked out of the house when he made that video, right? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, you spend a couple sentences on it, but then uh, you don't actually quote from it. You say, uh, the video shows him indicating his desire to harm students at the school, right? Those are your words, correct? That is correct. And you would agree with me, doctor, of the 20,000 text messages, you make no reference to 99% of those. You just include the 1%. That were relevant, yes. And doctor, uh, in your report, at least, you never talk about the defendant's internet searches. Agree? That is correct. And you were aware they existed. You testified. You you did pull out one about the dog, so you knew they existed. You just didn't reference them in your report. That is correct. In fact, you don't mention the shooting at all or the shooting video in the report, do you? You you saw it, but you don't mention it, do you? It's on page one of my report. The shooting. What are you talking about, doctor? said I have not mentioned the uh, shooting and I'm saying yeah. that the, one of my reported by reports paragraph. Oh, where you say he allegedly shot and killed four of his classmates? Oh, right. You never talk about the defendant's motivation, do you? You never talk about the defendant's motivation, right? I mentioned his mental illness, sir. Doctor, my question is not his mental illness, it's his motivation. Why does he want to kill people? You didn't talk about that in your report, did you? I did. Where? In my testimony, sir. I spoke about his obsession and his compulsions. Doctor, I'm talking about what motivated him. Why did he want to kill other people? I seem to think Ethan knows fully why he wanted to kill him. Okay. I'm glad you said that, doctor, because we're going to look at some things and see if Ethan tells us, sure. the shooter tells us, why he was motivated to do that. All right, doctor, I'm going to show you a series of clips from the journal, the text messages, internet searches, and so forth. I want to go through those with you. All right, okay. First one, doctor, page 22 of the journal, and the defendant says... Then I will walk behind any girl pretty and shoot them in the back of the head. I will then shoot everyone I see aiming for the head. You see that? I do. Next slide, please. I will continue shooting people until police breach the building. I will then surrender to them and plead guilty to life in prison. You see that? I do. Next slide, please. I want the world to remember me. That's in the journal, right? You saw that. That is correct. You don't reference that in your report, though, do you? That is correct. Next slide, please. Killing myself is too much of a pussy move. People will just forget about me, and I will have never made making an impact in this world. The only way is to shoot up the school. You see that? I do. And you were aware of that. You read that, right? 
Next slide. I'm going to kill many, many people for no sole reason. I'm going to rain fucking fire down on the school. I will cause the biggest school shooting in Michigan history. I will kill everyone I fucking see. You see that? I do. That tells us something about his motivation, right? It does. And in fact, he's right about Michigan history, isn't he? Isn't he? I won't answer, sir. So far, yes. Next slide, please. I want to remember throughout all of history. Right? I see that. Okay. You saw that before. I'm not showing you the first for the first time, right? You've seen the journal. That is correct. Next slide, please. I would just hope their parents will fill with sadness. And is it distraught? When I shoot up the school, I hope that every parent of kids I gravely murder will be so sad that they kill themselves. You see that? Those are the facts of the case. Hold on, doctor. It's not just the facts of the case. This is the defendant's own words, right? Okay. When they saw the video, when they show the video in court, everyone can see their children and friends dying. And I want for the parents to see their kids burn to ash and ball their eyes out. I'm going to spend the rest of my life in prison. You see that? I do. Next slide, please. Defendant's Journal, page 18. The vic first victim has to be a pretty girl with a future. You see that? I do. And it shows a gun to the back of the head of a girl, right? I do. Next slide, please. I know that rarely any shootings have happened in Michigan, so that means I will cause the biggest school shooting ever in the state. I'm not going to tell myself I will surrender to the police. I wish to hear the screams of the children as I shoot them. You see that? I do. Next slide. So, Doctor, uh, on this slide, he's talking about um, what kind of weapon he has. You're aware at one point he has access to a 22 pistol, right? I do. And he says, I want to do the shooting with a 9 millimeter pistol because they are effective from killing, but all I got is a puny 22, right? You see that? Yes, sir. And then he draws a drawing of two different bullets. One's a, a 22 and one's a nine millimeter. And you're aware, doctor, one is a lot more deadly than the other, right? I take your word for it, sir. You're not aware of that? He was right about that, right? Yes, sir. Next slide, please. It just amuses me how I can cause people to talk about what I did. And it just makes me happy. Now he's talking about taking the bird head to school. You're aware of that incident, right? Yes, sir. And he says, now people are talking about me. That makes me happy, right? Yes, sir. I killed eight infant baby birds by slowly torturing, torturing them until death, right? Yes, sir. These are the defendant's words after torturing the baby birds and before killing his classmates, right? Yes, sir. I murdered an entire family of five newborn baby birds. I drowned them and burned them alive while they all screamed. I cut one in half and stuck the head of its brother in its stomach. You see that? Yes, sir. Again, these are the defendant's own thoughts and words ahead of the shooting. Right? Next yes. slide, please. If I kill myself, then people will not care about me and I will be forgotten within half a lifetime. That's why I'm going to cause the biggest school shooting of this decade and the only one in Michigan. Right? Yes, sir. I also want to react on how the world reacts to my shooting. I'm probably going to live the rest of my life in prison. You see that? Yes, sir. Next slide. He says again, I'm about to spend the rest of my life in prison, right? Yes, sir. Shortly before the shooting, I'm going to prison for life, and many people have about one day left to live, right? Yes, sir. All right. Now I want to go through some text messages, the defendant talking about violence against people. He's talking about drowning children. He says, just looking them in their eyes as they look back at you while they know that their entire life is about to end so young, the best feeling. But stick your fingers into their eye sockets and push down so they scream in pain and drown their lungs with water. 
just thinking about the torturing and the screaming and the way their legs flail in the air as they cry, it fills the void. You read that, Doctor. Yes, sir. And again, you read that before your reports, but you decided that wasn't relevant to your report, correct? Correct? They're all relevant to my report, sir. But you didn't include it. That is correct. All right. Next slide. Whenever I see a little kid about a year old or a little more, I want to pick them up and run off with them, then torture them before throwing them off a cliff. And then I will kill any innocent. I don't care who I kill. I will kill who I feel like killing. Age, gender, I don't care, right? I don't care about innocent. Killing the innocent is the same as killing the bad. It both satisfies. You're aware of those texts? Yes, sir. Next slide. I want to take the ax and chip a bird in half, presumably chop a bird in half. Shoot it, torture it, dissect it. I want to chop it in half with an axe. Talking about fish, then I want to kill it while it is live so that it can feel the pain. Next slide, please. More about the birds. Also, there is a baby bird nest right next to my house with five baby birds in it. I can also reach them. Tomorrow I'm making my move. I will get video and pics. I can't wait till tomorrow. There is five and they're going to die anyways. I want to take something heavy and break its beak. I can't wait, dude. I'm so fucked up. I'm going to break its beak, then chop its head off. I'm going to take so many vids and pics. You've seen all these, right, Doctor? Yes, sir. I want to hear it scream. The first bird, though, I want to torture it. And it's so young, too. Like, it's just born, and it's already going to be killed. It's like two days old. I'm going to snap the beak off, and then chop its head off. Then take out its heart, then chop it in pieces. And also take out the brain, then smash it to little bits. I'm so fucked up, I like it. Jeffrey Dahmer got the good idea. Only thing he did wrong was get caught. More about the birds. I want to kill another bird so badly. Or baby bird. I can reach into the nest. They are not safe. Dur during third hour, all I thought about was ways to torture the bird. I'm going to film this like a documentary. My dad is pulling out of the driveway. Now, I'm going to wait a couple minutes, though, just in case he comes back. Right? So he's talking about his joy in killing birds, but also then what he wants to do to the birds. But doctor, he doesn't just talk about it, then he goes and does it, right? And he videotapes it. And then he texts his friend about that, right? And he says, I just finished. The vid is too long, so I can't. Can he ask, you have to ask a question. I'm sorry. So you agree with me that after he made those statements about his plans, he then did go and do it, right? Yes, sir. And you would agree with me that, that he then wrote about that after he'd done it, right? Yes, sir. And he wrote to? Uh, B, right? Well, let us back up again. All right, and what he said to B is, I just finished. The vid is too long, so I can't send, but I can send pics right before I throw it out. Sends a picture. I'm sorry, one more. All right, so we're reading the, the text on the screen. It's so fucking, dis I can't wait to show you the vid. It's so fucking disturbing. And as I don't even remember saying half the stuff, like I talked to the bird like a little child while torturing. I can't wait to show you. It was so fucking fun. Thing is, the vid halfs way through, so you can't see the good stuff. I put a drill in its stomach and skull. I also shot the gun at it a couple times in the stomach and its head. I also chopped it in half with an ax. I also smashed its head in with a hammer. At the end, and its eyes bulged out just like Glenn's. Do you know who Glenn is? I do not. You know, it's a, a reference to uh, The Walking Dead. I'm not a movie fan, sir. I apologize. Did you ask the defendant about that? No, sir. Like, the eyelids came apart so that I could see the bird's eye. There are still three birds left. I was originally going to try to stick a toothpick up its ass, but I couldn't find any. God, I can't wait to show you the vid. It's eight minutes long. Like, I couldn't stop laughing my ass off when I rewatched the vid. Again, you're familiar with all of that. Yes, sir. All right, and now, next slide, please. This is what I meant the other, so this is a text from the defendant to B. This is what I meant the other day of how I need a recharge to kill again. Now, tomorrow, I really want a bird, but I want it to be alive when I chop its head off, right? God, I want to kill. I hit a, hit a bird yesterday two times, but it flew away. And continuing with the birds, there have been no baby birds to torture in for a long time, and I'm getting that feeling where I need to kill again. 
I like killing the big birds, but I like killing the baby birds more, mostly because they're so young and they had a whole life ahead of them. But then I took it away. That's what I like. And also they're helpless and they scream when you hurt them. Doc, you see a theme there with the, the students he wants to kill and the birds? I do. That he takes joy in killing younger people, younger birds. He talks about killing children, right? He does. So he talks about killing and then he talks about better killing. Would you agree? What makes him feel better? I do agree. Doctor, we don't need to spend much time on these, but you you understand that in addition to his internet searches about the about a, a dog, he also repeatedly searched about prison sentences in Michigan. What's the worst present prison sentence you can get? What is a life sentence? What is a sentence for a 15 year old legal age to be sent to prison, youth correctional facility? What prisons are there in Michigan? The Oxford High School layout, and then this one's important. What is the average response time for a shooting? You're aware of all of those. Yes, sir. And then, doctor, there's a little bit more. You reviewed the manifesto video, right? I did. And in the manifesto video, you heard the defendant say in his own voice, when the bell rings to end fifth hour tomorrow, October 30th, oops, November 30th, 2021, I'm going to walk to the dividend between the boys and the girls' bathroom and I will have my black jacket on and I will walk behind someone and I will shoot a bullet in their skull. Yeah, that's my first victim. I'm going to open fire on everyone in the hallway. The hallways are too jam packed. I will try to hit as many people as I can. I will reload and I will find people hiding. You heard him say that. You listened to that video, right? I did. And then you heard him say, I understand that I'm going to prison for this. Michigan doesn't have a death penalty. I don't want to die. As funny as it may seem, I want to kill a lot of people. I do not want to die. I realize how valuable life is. This is the defendant, what, 12 hours before he starts killing people, right? And he's expressing what he intends to do and then what he does do, right? Yes, sir. All right. And then you hear him say, just the thought of, oh, there's so many people who think they're going to live the life, going to go to college, have a great career, get a family, grow old, die happily. And what they don't know that in less than a day, they're going to die and their lives are going to be changed forever, right? Yes, sir. And he's right about that, right? He's correct. I understand my consequences. I understand that people put me in prison for this, right? Yes, sir. And then that first video ends, and then he records a second one saying, fuck that previous video I took. That was bullshit what I said. I'm going to have so much fun tomorrow. I have a goal, and it's to kill everyone. Right? Yes, sir. Now, doctor, you may say this is like grandiose juvenile stuff, right? No, sir. That is very serious stuff. All right. So when we look at the defendant's messages, doctor, he tells us a lot about why he's doing what he's doing. And that's why I asked you about his motivation. You talked about the testing, but he tells us, right, that what he wanted was to be famous, right? That is correct. That was his really primary, his only motivation. He liked killing, but he really wanted to be famous, right? That is correct. So we agree it wasn't a fight or a robbery. No one was defending themselves, right? That is correct. And he didn't want anything from the victims. There's nothing they could have given where he said, like, if you give me this, I'll spare your life. He didn't want anything from him, right? That is correct. All right. And none of them had done anything to him, right? He hadn't been bullied. He didn't even know these specific people he killed, right? That is correct. And he wasn't seeking revenge. It's not like someone had done him wrong and he said, you know what, I'm going to get him back for that. That is correct. And you would agree that that can be kind of a juvenile thing, right? You feel that you've been... Uh, dismissed or mistreated and you you want to lash out at that person right that does happen sometimes and you agree this this shooting is not that right i do agree so his goal and the reason for the victim is he just wants to maximize the number of people he killed so that he can commit the biggest mass shooting so that he can be remembered right that is correct we also learn about what kind of victim he's looking for, and we just talked about this. He, he wants younger victims, and he actually talks about probably not killing teachers, right? That is correct. Right. Doctor, this, this thing about the defendant specifically choosing not to kill himself, have you ever seen that before? I have. Each one is one mass shooter that I've interviewed, so it's like, and that's it. That's my 20 ass I can give you. All right. Have you, 
Okay, so you don't have experience with other mass shooters. You can't speak to that. That is correct. So it's important, doctor, at least at least to me, when he expresses what he's going to do, for instance, shooting people in the head, and that's what he carries through and does, right? That is correct. You know, doctor, uh, you have this comment about the bird video, and you say that the defendant probably saw this as a way of releasing the pain he was feeling inside. Just so we're clear, you saw the slides. That's that's not what he said, right? That's not what he said. That's your impression. That is correct. Doctor, when you watch the, the bird being tortured, do you get any sense that that's difficult for the defendant, that, that made him uncomfortable, that he had any qualms about it? He de-associated from what was happening. Okay, so the person who was torturing the birds didn't have any qualms, you're saying, but that's that's him dissociating from from what? From reality. So you're saying he did that during the torture, but not when he's texting his friend and talking about it, right? Not when he's rewatching the video. That is correct. Doctor, you reviewed Dr. Anaker's report, and when he's talking about the birds, he says, it just made a good feeling, and I don't know how to describe it. I made a little area in my parents' shed, and I would form different torture techniques on it, cutting it or breaking its limbs or drowning it or burning it, seven baby birds in total from two different nests, and I would take the BB gun and shoot them or hit them with a baseball bat. He indicated he worked on the birds over the course of a few months. He was asked what his thoughts or feelings arose when he tortured the birds. He stated, it's like a feeling between good and pleasurable. A relief feel, feeling in power. I don't know. It just felt good. Doc, you talked about this tension removal, tension release, right? After the defendant kills a bird or a person, he's he feels relieved somehow. That is correct. Um, when you comment on the manifesto video, you say the video shows the defendant's inability to contain his thoughts any longer. But again, this is your interpretation, right? It's not. Well, let me let me jump ahead, doctor, because the next day in the counselor's office, he was perfectly capable of containing his thoughts, right? He didn't have to say those things there. He, he chose not to say them, right? That is correct. Um, doctor, there are a couple of other areas you didn't address. I just want to make sure that you agree with me. They're not part of this case. This defendant did not have a learning disability, right? That is correct. And you agree that this defendant has has very good adaptive skills, right? He has some trouble getting out of bed in the morning or getting his things together or getting to school, right? Carrying out a plan. That is correct. All right. And you would agree in this case the defendant didn't act on impulse. This was not an impulsive crime. That is correct. All right, doctor, I want to move on now. You mentioned in your direct testimony that some of the language in your report came from another report, right? That is correct. Hmm. You said your understanding was you had permission to use it, right? Mm -hmm. Who who told you had permission to use it? The attorney um, that uh, retained me. And who is that attorney? I don't think it's appropriate for me to mention his name. And doctor, I talked to you. The attorney's name is uh, Sheldon. Sorry. I think it's Sheldon. Can you spell that for me, doctor? I, I think I think it's S H E L L M A N. The spelling could be off. And doctor, what case was that in? It was one of my first cases. In 2019, you said? Yes. Do you have your CV in front of you, doctor? I do. You can just take a quick look. You list the 20 cases you've been involved in, and I, I want to. Make sure I know which case you're talking about. Sure. I'm 
looking at it right now. Okay. If you can just see from that list of cases, I think there may be a date order that you might be able to tell us. I think it's uh, the people versus uh, Lewis. I think it's the people versus Lewis. All right. And you're saying that that attorney said, here's a report from another expert and it's okay for you to use parts of that report. Yes. What report was that? Who was the expert? I believe it's Dr. Holden. I'm not sure, but I believe it's Dr. Holden. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? Yes, have you shown it to the counsel? Just hand it to defense counsel. Thank you. <clears throat> Doctor, I'm showing you what's been marked as a simple proposed exhibit 65. Would you take a look at that, please? That's a report authored by Dr. Carol E. Holden. It's dated April 4th of 2018, and it relates to People versus Gary Peters, which is a case in Macomb County Circuit Court. We'll take a look at that, Doctor, briefly. Just page through that. Let me know if you recognize that. This looks like it. I can't verify the report, but I think this is the. This looks like it, sir. Okay, we're going to go over it and we can, okay. we can come back to that. Um, so, Doctor, can you tell the court which sections of your report that are cut and pasted from someone else's work? Are cut and pasted? Um, I, what I'm looking for, Doctor, is the language that you took from someone else's report, language that you did not write yourself. Sure. You can look at Dr. Holden's report or you can look at your report. Yeah. What I want to know is in your report, your June 16th report, which parts did you take from someone else? Sure. So I actually used the same format that I indicated in my testimony, summary of opinion, sources of information, notification of purposes, Doctor, I want to shorten this up. I'm only only interested in what are essentially word for word cut and paste from the report. So I understand there's format and there's some things that do are identical, but they're they're pretty standard. I'm talking about stuff that you just dropped it in. So my report is seven to pages and this report is 12 pages. Um, my report has 15 psychological tests and this report has none. So um, Dr. I think your answer is you, you can't tell me right now as you sit here which parts you took from Dr. Correct. Holden's report. Okay. Um, doctor, when did you find out that, that I knew you had taken portions of someone else's report? When did you learn that? Actually through uh, the attorney who retained me. Okay. And um, they, they alerted you. They said, hey, the prosecutor's office is asking for Dr. Holden's report, and I think there's something up. I don't know about they. I know about uh, Ethan's attorney who retained me. Okay, they brought you the report and said, hey, or they, they said to you, there's an issue here, right? You didn't bring it to them. So you keep saying they, sir. I can only tell you one person that I had a conversation with. Okay. And that is uh, Paula uh, Lockwood. Okay, about this report, and it's not you told her, it's she told you. Correct. Okay. All right, so what I want to do is um, look at, what I'd like you to do is, uh, first, on the first page of Dr. Holden, so I want you to look at Dr. Holden's report. On the first page, she indicates that Mr. Peters was referred to her, quote, for a psychological evaluation focused particularly on the sentencing factors outlined in Miller versus Alabama. Do you see that? Okay. On the first page. Yes. Okay. On the and, uh, summary of, of opinion? Yes. Yes, I see that. And, and, Doctor, that's the same reason that the defendant was referred to you, right? It's the same purpose. Absolutely. Okay. And then, Doctor, I want to go through a little bit of the substance of that report. If you look, Dr. Holden references that the defendant in that case, Mr. Peters, was repeatedly placed out of his home over his entire childhood. That's going to be on pages three to five of her report. Okay. 
you know, Doctor, we're going to save a little bit of time here. I'm going to I'm going to represent to you that in that report, Doctor Holden reviews the uh, Mr. Peters' out of home placement on pages three to five. She references his record of delinquency on pages four to five, and she references his prison record on pages nine through eleven of her report. And then, Doctor, I want you to turn to it's page eleven. Also, so you're aware, I don't have this report that you're referencing. Yeah. Um, doctor, I mean, pardon me. Judge, I, if it's all right, I'll give you a copy, and then once I've established with the doctor, I'll move to admit it. Is that any objection, folks? At, at this point, I am objecting, yes. Thank you. I will wait until it's actually in the entire box. All right, doctor. So let's turn, I believe it's on page 11. <clears throat> All right, sorry, Dr. Page 12, the last real full paragraph, it starts in formulating, in formulating my opinion. You see that? I do. It says, I gave the juvenile's potential for rehabilitation considerable weight because the amount of time since Mr. Peters was originally sentenced offers the opportunity to assess this factor in a way not possible when he was 17, right? You see that? Yes, sir. And then it says, All right, so we're back to page 11, second paragraph under conclusion. And it starts, the extent to which a psychological evaluation may be of value to a sentencer. You see that? I do. And then at the bottom of that paragraph, it represents, it says, from research on, for example, adolescent psychological and brain development, trauma, out-of-home placement, delinquency, and prison adjustment. You see that? I do. All right, now what I'd like you to do, doctor, is you've got Dr. Holden's report, right? I do. And I want you to open that back to page 11. And I'm going to open my copy of your June 16th report. And I know the court has a copy also of the June 16th report. Where you say conclusion, what I'd like you to do is read Dr. Peter's report, starting with the word conclusion. Doctor, I'm sorry, Dr. Holden's report regarding Mr. Peters. And so what I'd like you to do is read with the word, starting with the word conclusion, start reading Dr. Peter's 2018 report. Dr. Holden. Dr. Holden. Yeah. Thank you. Certainly, would you like me to start? Yes, please. Sure. So, Miller v. Alabama, requires that the sentences take into account how children are different and how those differences counsel against the hope of his sentence in time to life in prison. And that's a quote. By considering the factors dis discussed above. Please continue. The extent to which a psychological evaluation may be of value to a sentencer varies across the factors and how best to weigh and combine the factors in sentencing a given individual is of course a legal rather than psychological question. I consider the factors from a forensic psychologist perspective, taking into account information obtained from Mr. Peters and from available records from research on, for example, adolescence, psychological and brain development, trauma, out of home placement, delinquency and prison adjustment, and from my current psychological evaluation. Please continue. As described in detail above, at the time of his offense, Mr. Peter, Peters was a late adolescent. Psychological and neuroscience research has clearly demonstrated that even late adolescents are different from adults. And consistent with this research, compared to an adult, young Mr. Peters was less capable of considering alternatives more focus on potential reward versus potential risk, more likely to take such a risk, and less able to consider the long-term consequences of his actions. Mr. Peter's impulsivity, impulsivity sorry, 
and failure to consider the consequences of his actions, lack of social skills and vulnerability. Dr. I want to stop you just for one second. So there's a part here where it, it deviates from your report. Go ahead and continue though. Lack of social skills. And vulnerability to peer pressure and immaturity were particularly striking to the MDOC psychologist who evaluated him early in his incarceration, as was the fact that Mr. Peters' antisocial and angry attitudes and behaviors so clearly served to ward off many painful feelings. All right, now, Doctor, I want to jump down to that last paragraph on page 12 of Dr. Holden's report. It starts with, with the above. Can you read that, please? With the above and the court's assertion that the distinctive, and this is quote, the distinctive attributes of youth diminishes the penological justification for imposing the harshest sentence on juvenile offenders, even when they commit terrible crimes. End of quote. In mind, it is my opinion that consideration of the Miller v. Alabama factors, especially the final factor, supports the sentence other than life without parole for Mr. Peters. All right, so doctor, we followed along and that's virtually word for word with just a few changes, mostly the defendant's name uh, from the two reports. You are not denying that that's where you got this language, correct? I am not. All right, Your Honor, I move to admit people's proposed 65. Your Honor, I am objecting. I, I don't believe it's relevant. Uh, this is a different defendant, a different, different fact pattern, a completely different case. Um, and Dr. King has testified that he used the rubric from this report. I don't think that the court then needs to have the report to be able to come to the conclusion that he has used somebody else's rubric, not somebody else's opinion, but somebody else's rubric. I don't think the facts and the specifics of a case from years ago in 2019 um, is relevant in this case whatsoever. So I'm objecting. Your response? Judge, I think the court can take it for what it's worth, but I actually want to talk to the doctor about the fact that that the contents of this report, Dr. Holden's report, fit her conclusion. The contents of Dr. King's report do not. You can ask me that question, but I don't see the need to admit it. I was actually following along as the doctor was reading from Dr. Holden's report, where it's clear that there is some language from that report that is significantly similar, if not the same, in his report that's on page 68. So I would note that the court um, doesn't need to have that admitted, but you can be very well asking questions about that. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Doctor, you say, use the word I, and then you say it is my opinion that you were especially relying on the final Miller factor, didn't you? That's that last paragraph. That is correct. So now I'm looking at your reports. So we're on page. Sixty-nine, at the very top, it is my opinion that considering the Miller of, of the Miller versus Alabama factors, especially the final factor, supports a sentence other than life without parole for Ethan. But, Doctor, that's that's in fact not your opinion, is it? It is my opinion. What's the final factor, Doctor? And that is the the juvenile's uh, potential for rehabilitation. Doctor, how many times does the word rehabilitation appear in your report? I can help you out one time, and it's not in reference to the defendant. It's the Americans with D Disabilities and Rehabilitation Act. Okay. How many times do you discuss the defendant's future, his potential, in any way, shape, or form? How many times? Do you discuss this defendant's future, his potential, his potential for rehabilitation in any way, shape, <clears throat> or form? Anything in your report that addresses that? I think it's contained throughout my report in terms of his me mental illness and um, ability to, to uh, respond. Why don't you point out where that is, doctor? Because I, I don't see it. It's throughout my uh, report. I don't know that there's a specific sentence. If you're looking for like the exact sentence, it's not in there. Not looking for the exact sentence. I'm looking for any sentence, doctor. Okay. So, doctor, the, the quote you just took from Dr. Holden, you talk about the defendant's impulsivity. You just read that to us, right? And that's in your report, right? The word impulse and impulsivity appears nowhere else in your report, only in that section you took from Dr. Holden. You agree with me? I do. And in fact, you agree this this defendant's crime had nothing to do with impulsivity, right? You've already testified to that. 
I testify that he's not impulsive? Correct. That this was not an impulsive act. You testified to that. That's I asked right. You. Okay. That's and right. so when you put that in your report, that shouldn't be there. That's because you cut and pasted it, right? The defendant is impulsive in relation to the crime. It was not an impulsive act. It was okay. a well planned out act. All right. Okay. So, Doctor, also, I want to go back a, a page. So we're at the first paragraph under sentencing request. So this is page 68, first paragraph under sentencing request, last sentence of that first paragraph. You talk about out-of-home placement, delinquency, and prison adjustment. You see that? This is your report now, page 68. Which section are you looking at? So are you looking at the first paragraph of the sentencing request on page 68? Yes, Your Honor. It's the last sentence of that first paragraph. Page 68. I'm still trying to get there. You seeing the, the first paragraph of page 68? May I approach, Your Honor? Yes. So, Doctor, I'm looking at sentencing request, first paragraph, last sentence. So I'm looking at research on, for example, adolescent psychological and brain development. I see that, Judge. Can you thank you. finish out that sentence? Out of home placement, delinquency, and prison adjustment. You see that? Yes. All right. You don't make any mention of foster care of an, an out of home placement in your report regarding this defendant, do you? That is correct. In fact, this defendant was never placed out of his home, was he? He was never. And he never went to foster care, right? That is correct. You make no reference to delinquency in your report regarding this defendant, do you? That is correct. Okay, and in fact, this defendant did not have any record of delinquency, did he? He did not. And you don't make a reference to a prison record in your report, do you? That is correct. The defendant's never been to prison, has he? That is correct. All right, and to the extent he's been in jail, you didn't review those records or include anything about that in your report? Can you repeat that, please? So this mentions prison adjustment. What I'm saying is, he didn't go to prison, and to the extent that uh, he's been in jail, you didn't address that in your report. That is correct. All right. All right, so doctor, um, if you look at the probably page three of your report, maybe four, let's see. All right, page four of your June report, Miller versus Alabama factors. You never list the potential for rehabilitation as a factor. You agree with me? Which, which page are you on, sir? I'm looking at page four, where at the top you say Miller versus Alabama factors, and then you have chronological age as the first thing, right? That is correct. And what I'm trying to establish is nowhere in your report do you ever list the potential for rehabilitation as a Miller factor, do you? That's correct. That, and, that and, may be correct. Okay, you don't list as a factor, and then you don't discuss rehabilitation or potential rehabilitation, correct? Throughout my report, no. All right, you don't explicitly discuss it. You discuss it. You say it's part of your whole report. Correct. Doctor, not listing that as a factor and not explicitly discussion, discussing that, that, that was a conscious decision you made, correct? It's not listed, sir. And I'm asking you, doctor, that was a conscious decision you made. Doctor, in your in your Jamar Johnson report, you know who Jamar Johnson is, right? I think he's someone that I, I'm assuming he's someone that I evaluated years ago or several months ago. Doctor, in 2020, you wrote a report uh, regarding a Jamar Johnson for Wayne County, it looks like. You were, you familiar with that? You want to look at your CV? You agree that you wrote a report for Jamar Johnson? The names, I'm pretty sure I did. And I take your, your word for it, sir. I'm 
Judge, I don't intend to admit this, but may I approach with it and see if I can re recollect, refresh his recollection? I don't have a copy of it, Your Honor. If you can show the page before you approach. I can. Doc, what I'm showing you is just to refresh your recollection. This is a September 24th, 2020 report. I believe you authored that I want to see if it refreshes your recollection. This is my report, sir. Okay. And in that report, you specifically list the potential for rehabilitation as a factor, right? I probably did. It's a heading. So if you flip through, it's not just buried in there. It's a, it's a heading. It says potential rehabilitation. Okay. So what I'm trying to establish here, doctor, is that when you've addressed that factor before, you've expressly included in your report, you know it's a Miller factor, and you made a conscious decision not to include it in the report regarding this defendant. I don't know that, that I made a conscious uh, decision. It's not included. That's what I can tell you. It's not included. Was it a mistake? Sir, it's not included. Doctor, I'm aware it's not included. I'm trying to ask you why. Because what I'm what I'm suggesting to you and what I'm asking you is you've made a conscious decision. You decided not to include it. That is correct. Okay. Doctor, you also made that same decision. I can take that back from you. Okay. Okay, Doctor. There are two other Miller factors you don't list and you don't address. So the fourth Miller factor is the, the incompetencies of youth which affect whether the juvenile might have been charged with and convicted of a lesser crime. For example, because the juvenile did not have the capacity to assist their attorney in their own defense. Would you agree with me, doctor? You, you didn't list that as a, a Miller factor in your report regarding this defendant. I think that's correct. And in fact, that's because it's a conscious decision. It doesn't apply here, right? There wasn't any plea deal. There was no, that has no relevance to this case. That is correct. All right. And in fact, you also don't uh, list the third Miller factor, right? Which is the circumstances of the homicide offense, including the extent of the juvenile's participation in the conduct and the way familial and peer pressures may have affected the juvenile. That is correct. So you agree that's not in your report and that's a conscious decision, right? Because in this case, it's just not mitigated. It's not in the report, sir. Doctor, I, I know it's not in the report. What I'm asking you is you consciously decided. Your job was to find mitigating facts, right? That was your job. And you looked at all the factors, right? Certainly. And you determined that some factors you could provide some mitigating evidence on, right? I did. And on the third factor, the circumstance of the homicide offense, including the extent of his participation and the way familial and peer pressure may have affected the juvenile, you didn't list it and you didn't address it because it's not mitigating, right? That is correct. So, Doctor, you've never evaluated any other mass shooters, correct? No, sir. You wear how many mass shooters? there have ever been in Michigan since 1966? I'm not, I'm not aware. Five. And you know how many of those defendants were under 18 when they committed the shooting? No, sir. Only one, this defendant. You know how many people under 18 have committed a school mass shooting where there are four or more people killed since 1966 in the entire country? I know since 1999, there's been, there's been over 386 mass shootings. Four more killed, doctor. It's a much smaller group. 16 since 1966 mass school shooters in the country. And you know how many of those survived? Can you repeat that, sir? How many of those 16 survived? Do you know? I'm not aware. All right, seven. Seven of those people <laughs> survived. And my question to you, doctor, is how many mass shooters ever have committed their mass shooting with a plan to survive, not to kill themselves, not to get gunned down by the police, but with a specific plan to survive and go to prison for life so they could see their victims suffering. I don't know how many, sir. Can you name one? 
said, I don't know when. So just a couple of, of, of you know, quick things. Um, doctor, you mentioned um, something about uh, with, with his parents, um, someone doing something out of spite, his father doing something out of spite. Do you remember that? I do. What, what was that in reference to? I believe it was in reference to his father buying him a gun. Um, oh, out of spite against his mother. I, I think that's what I referenced. Where did you learn that? I'm sorry? Where did you learn that? Like, what did that come from, that, that reference? Where did you get that information? From the defendant. Okay. Doctor, you referenced, uh, th this is something I want to come back to. So in your January report, at the end, you referenced the defendant um, sitting in a corner and crying. You remember we went over that, right? I think he says sitting in a cafeteria. Okay, sitting in a cafeteria and crying. And um, I said that's not in your... June report, and, and then you said, yes, it is. You had one, but then we established there's this, the one that we're working from does not have that, that is correct. sentence. And I said to you, where did you get that from? What I'm saying to you, doctor, that didn't happen. That's what I'm trying to, to say to you. And you're saying it did. Sitting in, in the cafeteria? Crying. That was my impression, sir. Your statement is? And it's a January 27th report, and it says that <clears throat> you know, so, I'm going to object at this point. This has already been asked and answered. He already discussed the, the statement that was in one report and not in the other report, and he gave a context for that. This has already been answered. Well, I need to hear the question first. He had to answer Understood. the question. So, doctor, we noted the sentence. I'm going to read you the sentence. Surveillance video shows the defendant sitting on the ground, crying, fully well knowing that he's on a path of no return. That was the sentence in your January report and the one you brought to court today, right? Okay. And I said to you basically, that didn't happen, right? Did that happen? I In, in my viewing of the video, sir, I observed the defendant sitting by himself and appeared to be crying. So he wasn't sitting on the ground, right? Wherever he was sitting, sir, that is what I was referring to. Can you explain why that was taken out of your report? Absolutely. Who took it out? You will be. I did. Counsel, you asked another question while I'm trying I'm to sorry. answer the first question. Please re ask the question. Who took that sentence out of your report? I'm responsible for my reports, sir. I did. Okay. And why? My report has gone through, and you are aware also that it has gone through a transition. You can continue to answer, sir, on this. Matter of fact, we have sent, I have sent several versions of, of the report, sir, and matter of fact, one recommendation came from your office mm -hmm. that I should revise my, my uh, report and include um, uh, the uh, journal and the court video, and then we sent another iteration. So the report that we're talking about has been a living, breathing document. We've been asked to send revisions, and that is exactly what we did. You're right, doctor. We did bring that to your attention through counsel, right? Sure. And we said that the defendant needs a thorough report that addressed all of the facts in the case, right? Absolutely. Including things that happened the night before, like his parents kicking him out, right? That is correct. So that explains the revision of my uh, report. It doesn't explain this sentence. And, and it's funny, doctor, now when I'm asking you the question, you say, well, that was your impression, or he was sitting by himself. But when I asked you this morning, you told me that that happened and that you saw it on a video from the cafeteria, correct? That is correct. Do you want to look at that video? Do I want to look at it? Do you want to look at that video? Because, doctor, that's not on there. Okay. For the record, you're showing something on the screen. 
Yes, Your Honor. This is a video um, that's taken from the school cafeteria between the time of, this is at 11.51 a.m. So this is after the meeting with the counselor in the office before the shooting. Pardon me, 11.53. And what this shows is the defendant who's on the left side of the hallway walking towards the frame. He's going to walk up. He's going to sit down at the table in the lower right. And then he sits there for about 15 minutes. He's on his phone. He does not sit on the ground. And, and I've looked at it. There's no sign that he's crying. He's simply on his phone sitting there. So we can show that now. You oh, it's already full 15 minutes. I think only judge if the witness tells me I'm going to see something other than what we see right now, which is the defendant on his phone at the table. Can you watch the whole thing, Doctor? You see anything other than that? That's a video that uh, I saw. Okay. And you, there's 15 minutes. Do we need to watch the rest? Do you agree? That's what it shows. I don't think it's necessary. But it's just your call. Counsel, respectfully, I don't need to see this video for 15 minutes to waste the time. So I'm going to ask that you move on. Thank you, Your Honor. I will. Thank you. Yeah, so doctor, can you list the things that when we talked to you through counsel, we said, look, you got to address this stuff. Do you know what those things were? The things you didn't address in your first report? So I don't think there's any way for me to recall. You know, it's not humanly possible. Okay. I mean, but I looked at thousands of pages and videos and journals, and it's not, it's not practical for me to tell you one, two, three, four, five. It's just not possible. All right. But but you did make changes, and they were partly at our request, and they were to actually mention things like the journal, right? Like yes, the you birth. asked me to revise school counsel. You asked me to revise my uh, report, and we did, and we sent revisions over to your office. Doctor, actually, what we asked is that you include all of the evidence, that you address all of the facts before the court, right? That you address the, the very obvious things that need to be addressed, like the journal, the text messages, the internet searches, right? So it's not possible for me to send you 20,000 text messages. They could not have been included in my report. It wasn't possible. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Before we direct, we're going to take about a five to ten minute break. Uh, before we take a break, counsel, please approach. To the media, you are not to record the bench conferences. I know that my staff sent me a note that says that this microphone was recorded on the last bench conference. That shall not happen.
Thank you, Amit. See you. Crumley, case number 2022 279 Thank you. Pierce is for the record. Karen McDonough on behalf of the people. Thank you, Mark Keith on behalf of the people. David Williams on behalf of the people. Paulette Michelle Lawson on behalf of the people and Crumley. Kimmy Kaplan on behalf of the people and Crumley. The Ray St. Kelby on behalf of the people and Crumley. Thank you. You all may be seated. Doctor, you may retake the stand again, sir. And again, Doctor, you remain under oath, sir. Thank you, sir. You're very welcome. You may be seated. Defense Vigret. Yes, thank you. thank you. Doctor, there was a lot of talk about, or a lot of questions, I should say, about the changes in your report. Um, and that the report, I believe you said, was like a living document. Um, it changed as different things were brought to your attention. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Even after authoring the report dated June 16th, you continued to v visit Ethan and continued to review evidence. Is that correct? That is correct. If for some reason you had received a piece of evidence or something had been brought to light since your report dated June 16th of 2023, and you felt for some reason that your opinion changed, would you be sitting here today and committing to your opinion that you have in paper dated June 16th? No, I would have amended my opinion. Now, there was conversation about all of the evidence that you viewed. We actually went to the prosecutor's office to view the bird video, the security footage, the rec and the, the footage of the whole day, not just the footage that we were shown today, and the recording the night before, correct? That is correct. I want to talk about the phone call with the neighbor. Um, was it your understanding that this neighbor appeared in the news and then contacted me? Yes, that is correct. And then that person was willing to contact you, correct? That is correct. And you had a full conversation with this person, correct? That is correct. Okay. And they identified themselves as a neighbor? That is correct. And in that phone call, was it detailed to you, the same thing that had been detailed in a number of investigators' reports, that Ethan was left home alone often from a young age? That is correct. If you were to list in your report every single text message, video, um, the 10,000 pages plus of discovery, how long would your report be? At least 5,000 pages. Did you pick and choose what you thought was the most important to your findings and put it in your report? I did. So when Mr. Williams goes through the things that you did not include and you had answered the questions, I do think those things are important. Is it true that you, you took those into account? You may have not said the words about the video, said each word about the journal, but were all of those things in your mind when you rendered an opinion? Yes, ma'am. I wanna talk about ACEs because there was so much discussion about that. Do you need to perform the ACEs test to conclude what you did? No, you don't. And why is that? Because once you have the information uh, for that assessment, there is no reason to, once again, go over each question because you already have the information. We went over the fact that there is a copy of your report dated in January that was turned in in April. And then there's the report dated in June. Then there was some conversation or some questioning about the fact that it was the prosecutor's office had, had asked um, that you include more details into your report about certain things. Do you remember that line of questioning? That is correct. Yes, Okay. Do. You had already viewed those things that were not included in your report 
when you authored your first report, correct? That is correct. Okay. So because they weren't present or they weren't in that first report, is that because they weren't important to you or that you didn't consider them or you simply just didn't put that in your report? That is correct. I just did not put them in my report. And when we re-examined the report dated in January, we went over all of your findings and all of the evidence, correct? That is correct. Your opinion did not change from the January report to the June report, correct? That is correct. You changed words, but you didn't change your opinion, correct? That is correct. There was conversation about the violent videos. So if a person has violent thoughts and then continues to watch these violent videos day in and day out, what happens to that person? Essentially, that person loses sight of reality and begins to fantasize about what they're feasting on and then sort of start imagining themselves as a part of the action. So it was mentioned because it's mentioned in Dr. Anneker's report that at a very young age, Ethan uh, has a conversation with a teacher about wouldn't it be funny or wouldn't it be nice if you know, all these people end up in a car accident and then there's death. And the prosecutor had asked you questions. Well, look, he already has violent thoughts. So if someone's starting at a young age with these violent thoughts and then they watch the videos, how does that affect them? It can only get worse. It's actually a recipe for disaster. There was conversation about the video games. You were made aware that Ethan had started playing these violent video games at a very young age, correct? That is correct. The purpose of a criminal responsibility exam, what Dr. Anneker performed, is different than what you are here for today, correct? That is correct. There's a different purpose for your report, correct? That is correct. There was a lot of time spent on page 61, objective sources. What are objective sources? Objective sources are, are sources outside of the um, evaluator. For instance, a video will be considered an objective source. Okay. Because it's uh, it, it's something not, not um, inspired by the evaluator. What about text messages or a journal? Yes, those are objective sources. Okay, so when you're talking about objective sources, are these the things that you're talking about? That is correct. There was some conversation that when you're testing Ethan, you're only going off of what he's self-reporting. Do you remember that line of questions? I do. You also explained in direct that you tested him to see if he was feigning or faking, correct? That is correct. Can you describe for the court how you did that and why? So psychological tests uh, have built-in validity, um, validity scales, and the, the respondent does not know the questions that comprise the validity scales. You know, these scales have been validated for years and years and years, so they have nothing at all to do with me. I just mm -hmm. use the instrument. And if he were feigning, then his profile would have looked different. But based on the validity scales, and for instance, the mini mental mental status exam, which is a screening tool, and it gives the defendant the opportunity to feign or to fake the answers if he or she wants to. And if they do that, then their scores will be very different from normal people. So when I looked at Ethan's responses, they were very consistent with neurotypical. So that's how I knew that he was not feigning also on the um, evaluation of competency to stand trial, as I mentioned, um, that instrument is recognized by the United States Supreme Court, 1960, the People versus Dusky. And on the scales, um, he appeared competent to stand trial. If he wanted to, he could have feigned those answers, but he did not. 
there was a lot of questioning about Ethan's behavior following the shooting. The fact that he goes in the hallway, surrenders, he follows the directives of the sheriffs. He then is in the police car and there's no issues. There's no video showing him talking to voices out loud or appearing to be in distress. Does that change your opinion about whether or not he was suffering from mental illness on that day? It does not. You had discussed kind of a release. Can you explain that again briefly to the court? Why your opinion doesn't change, even though his behavior, he's able to comport back to reality and follow directions? Sure. So mental illness is a dynamic process. Um, I think I use examples of Robin Williams. I use examples of Twitch. Um, and there is a United States senator um, who not too long ago checked himself in due to clinical depression. And he represents this country at the highest level but he raised his hand and he said, I need help, I'm clinically depressed. Mm -hmm. And so the point I'm making is that mental illness is a dynamic process. There are some days when you can go to work and you show up and you do well. And then there's some days when you're not doing well. Well, that is mental illness. That's what it looks like. And psychosis itself, it isn't always what we envision um, as talking to voices. Or, or acting animated, correct? That is correct. So even though Ethan is not experiencing visible symptoms, that doesn't mean that anyone can conclude that he isn't exhibiting symptoms internally of psychosis. Is that fair? That is fair because if someone comes to that conclusion, then of the four things that I showed, they're, they're, they're guessing. Okay. I, I wanna talk a little bit about psychosis. If someone is having a psychotic episode, are they in it permanently, or do they then, at some point, regain their ability to be in reality? Sure, it waxes and it wanes. I have had the opportunity to hospitalize several, over 20 years, several mentally ill patients. And after treatment at a hospital, a number of them will return back to the group home, and within a couple of weeks, they were able to regain their neural uh, uh, typical function like going to work, taking their medication, and making informed decisions. So again, mental illness is a dynamic process. And some people assume that to be mentally ill, you have to be foaming at the mouth. You know, I use the example, you know, Senator Fetterman. Mm -hmm. He has clinical depression, but he's going to work now. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that he's not mentally ill? He raised his hand and said, I need help. So there was some conversation about the time on the messages and because of the, the actual time is not the 4.30 a.m. that you had referenced in your report. Does that change your opinion at all that it is in the late evening, early morning hours as opposed to four in the morning? It is immaterial. And Ethan self-reported to you that he was not sleeping, correct? That is correct. There was a lot of conversation on page 26 where you indicate sorrow over the outcome of his actions. And Mr. Williams took some time to say that you didn't follow up with the questions and we don't know why he's sorrow or he's upset. Maybe he's just upset because he finds himself in jail. That testing it is a set of questions that you ask. There is no follow-up, correct? That is correct. That test doesn't look for the reason, it looks for the symptom. That's exactly what it does. There was a lot of questions about what do you base your statements on? Um, you know, you don't have a site here. You've been qualified as an expert, correct? Several times. And you're here today to give your expert opinion, correct? Yes, ma'am. You were asked questions about how many millions of people suffer from depression and the fact that not all of them become mass shooters. Do you remember that question? I do. Okay. 
And that's because most of them get intervention, correct? Absolutely correct. That's because good parents recognize when their child is circling the drain, correct? That is correct. I want to talk a little bit about implicit bias. You don't blame defendant's actions on implicit bias, correct? I do not. Then why are you giving us the context of implicit bias? How does this fit with the facts of this case? Absolutely. So some people misconstrue the concept of implicit bias. Is it's, it racism? It has nothing to do with racism. And I just want to make that clear for the record. In no way, shape, or form am I saying that the Oxford school system is a racist system. That is not what I'm saying. Implicit bias has to do with being given information and evidence. But because of your unconscious impulses, you don't take action that, that you should take. That is the basic concept of implicit bias. So this isn't an excuse that you're giving for Ethan. This is an explanation. Is that correct? It's an explanation. There was questions asked about the fact that you don't know for sure that a teacher saw all of these assignments that were found in his backpack. You remember that? I do. But you were made aware of a note card that a teacher, when reviewing after seeing him search bullets and search other things, went back and looked at an assignment from September that she had not realized before, where in fact, he drew himself or an individual with a weapon and then erased the weapon, but it was still obvious. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am, that is correct. So we know for sure that that assignment was received. We know at least one assignment was turned in and was reviewed as confirmed by the teachers. That is a fact and that we do know. And we do know that that assignment was overlooked because it wasn't until November 29th or 30th that this teacher then went back to examine what he had turned in previously and discovered this, correct? That is correct. There's also no grade or score on that final assignment, the test review, which finally led him to being taken to the office, correct? That is correct. So we know that a teacher walking around and looking at what the students were writing observed that. Yes, ma'am. There were some questions about the fact that he was in the counseling office and he could have said, I've got a gun in my backpack, I need help. And that's true, correct? That is absolutely true. But he also, as you testified, wrote in his own words on the school assignment, help me, my life is useless, the world is dead, blood everywhere, correct? Yes, ma'am, that is correct. There was a line of questioning about the fact that he was obsessed with harming people. Um, it goes to, you know, we're talking about the torturing of the birds, the voluminous text messages about this desire to want to kill. That's because he was mentally ill, correct? Ethan is mentally ill, and there is no doubt in my mind based on the testing results. And that cannot be refuted based on the testing results. So Mr. Williams spent some time talking about motivation, motivation. Are you able to rationalize what Ethan did leading up to November 30th? I just want to say this, a number of innocent people died. And I'm not here to make excuses for Ethan's crime. A lot of innocent people died. He planned the attack, and my heart goes out to the victims and their families. So are you able to rationalize the steps that he took, or is it irrational because he was mentally ill? He was mentally ill. And please rephrase your question. So I need you to listen to the question, or a few of your responses have been unresponsive to the question. So I need you to listen to Absolutely. the question that's being asked of you. Please rephrase your question or re-ask it. I will re-ask it. Thank you. There was a line of questioning about what motivated Ethan. You remember that line of questioning? Yes, that okay. was correct. And you were unable to say specifically what it was that motivated him, correct? That is correct. Do you believe it was mental illness that motivated him to do all the research that he did, to plan out his 
attack and the actual shooting. I do. You were asked a number of questions of the journal. There, there is no argument that what he wrote in there is alarming. Do you agree with me? I do agree. Do those look like rational thoughts from someone that does not have a mental illness? They do not. Do the ramblings in that journal line up with the compulsive behavior that you described? Yes, ma'am. Does it line up with the anxiety that you described? Yes, ma'am. Does it line up with the depression that you described? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> I want to talk about the bird videos um, and the pleasure he finds in it. In watching the video, and I know that you touched on the fact that you can even hear like an elevated voice. What do those videos show you? The videos show a very ill individual deriving pleasure. That's what they show. There was a lot of questions about the fact that you did not write every specific fact or any of the specific facts that occurred in this case. To your knowledge, are any of those facts at issue? I don't think so. And you were told that Ethan pled guilty to all of the charges, correct? That is my understanding. Ethan never reported to you that it did not happen, correct? That is correct. There was some questioning asked about the fact that he was focusing on, on younger children, younger birds, helpless people. What do you make of that? So he certainly targeted younger birds first and fantasized about hurting younger people and given the level of obsession and compulsion, he sort of moved on from there to real people. Well, other people, I should say. The fact that there is premeditation and planning, does that mean that Ethan is not mentally ill? No. The fact that he discussing want to be, wanting to be famous are those the thoughts of someone with a healthy brain or an unhealthy brain? Unhealthy brain. I want to talk about Dr. Holden's report. Dr. Holden is a well-respected expert, correct? She is. She doesn't do any of the testing that you did, correct? I have not noticed any testing from Dr. Holden. The report um, that Brother Counsel showed you did not have any testing, correct? It did not. Did you come to your opinion on this case based on your testing in this case? Yes, ma'am. So when I made you aware that this would probably be something that Mr. Williams would address with you, you reviewed the report from Dr. Holden, correct? I did. And what steps did you take that you can tell us when you compared your report to Dr. Holden's report. Am I able to reference any document? I mean, I can, I can tell you. Would it assist your answer by looking at a document and I can provide it to brother counsel? Would you be able to answer your question if you're able to look at the papers contained in your um, folder there? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You may proceed, Ms. Tisha Prosky. <clears throat> and he actually has a copy. So what is it that you did with your report compared to Dr. Holden's report? So when the concerns were raised about the similarity of their reports, um, and I've done this before, I tasked my assistant with um, doing two independent uh, searches. There's a program called Copy Leaks and another one called editpad.org. What these programs do, they take one report, line it up with the other, 
and then they look for similarities and consistencies or differences. So that's what I had my assistant do, just because I anticipated that this was going to be an issue. So I have the results that, I, that my assistant ran. Okay, so we wanna focus on identical match. What percentage of these two reports is an identical match? Judge, I'm gonna to object to this until that other report is admitted. I don't think this document in any way, I want Dr. Holden's report admitted before there's a comparison, please. Thank you, so I, I need to understand your legal objection. What's your legal objection to this line of question? That there's not a foundation for this testimony without Dr. Holden's report. This is now a comparison between his report and Dr. Holden's report. Her report is not in evidence. Thank you. I agree with that, but I haven't seen Dr. Holden's report either, so that's not substantive evidence that's before this court. So the objection goes, well, you may continue with your line of questioning, but noting that the court has no idea what's inside Dr. Holden's report. Understood. Continue, Dr. Thank you very much. I just, I'm just going to ask one question. The percentage of the identical match between the two reports is what? 1.3%. Thank you. You were also asked and shown your report on a case of People versus Jamar Johnson, correct? That is correct. It's my understanding from that case, Mr. Johnson had done, had already done a significant period of time in prison, correct? That is correct. And so you were able to review prison records for a number of years for Mr. Johnson, correct? That is correct. So would, would you agree with me that it would be much easier to talk about the rehabilitation prospects or the actual rehabilitation when you have years of prison records showing that he either changed his behavior or listing all of the good things that he's done? That is correct. So your report here on Mr. Crumbly is different and yeah. different than probably almost all of the reports you completed because Mr. Crumbly hasn't been to prison yet, correct? That is correct. So you don't have a number of years of behavior, tickets, programs completed to look at, correct? That is correct. You were asked about the fourth Miller factor and the fact that you didn't address it, but you did actually do a competency test where you measure if he's able to assist his attorney in his own defense, correct? That is correct. So you may not have actually listed that fourth factor, but you definitely addressed it, correct? I did. May I have one moment? Yes. I have no further questions. Judges, very briefly. Under a, a council approach. Court would note that the time is approximately 3.44 p.m. I note that the people intend on calling a rebuttal witness. Defense, do you have any further witnesses at this time? We don't have any further witnesses, Your Honor, but I'm asking um, that you note the last four exhibits in my uh, binder that have been admitted. Exhibit T, there are letters of support 
from two family members of Ethan Crumbly. Exhibit U, it's a report of the legal guardian ad litem, Ms. McKelvey. V, the violence project report, which is a report that was created uh, at the people's request in the parents case. And W, a stipulation on the GED examination that will show that Ethan Crumbly paid for and completed all necessary testing to be able to take the GED, but unfortunately the jail could not accommodate that. Other than that, Your Honor, we rest. Okay, the court will so let counsel take this this afternoon. I note again that the people intend on calling a rebuttal witness. The time will late in the day, and so there's no reason possible that we're going to be able to get through the people's rebuttal witness before 4 30 p.m. I will also note that you all cannot return tomorrow. As you all are aware, we have to put a lot of things in place in order to have these hearings for three days. So we need to make sure for building safety uh, issues. We need to make sure that we also confer with the Oakland County Sheriff's Department. And so to make all of that happen, we need to adjourn this to another date, as well as the court is unavailable for some days. And so the return date that I discussed with counsel is August 18th, 2023 at 9 a.m. Counsel's already confirmed that that date will be shut down. I will also note that we need to address the defendant's placement at the Oakland County Jail, as we must review that every 30 days. People with any statements that relates to the defendant's placement at the Oakland County Jail. Sorry, we don't believe there's any changes in when placement's appropriate. Thank you, Fix. We have no arguments. Thank you. Based upon the court's previous ruling, the court does continue to believe that it is in the best interest of justice to continue the defendant's placement at the Oakland County Jail. We will return here on August 18th, 2023 at 9 a.m. to continue this hearing. At that time, the court will also give you another review hearing date as well as the decision date. As I discussed off the record, there are some things I need to address with the Oakland County Corrections before I set a sentencing date in this case. Anything else we need to address for the record before we hear for today? No, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And please be seated in the courtroom, uh, Ms. Eggman. Stands in recess. You are for the day. Thank you. All Thank right. You. Thank you, Judge.